1993, he was the world champion at the age of 21. Then in 1996, the bombshell. Lance Armstrong had testicular cancer. His world had collapsed. The cancer was at a very advanced stage with tumors the size of golf balls in his lungs. His doctors told him he had a 20 to 50% chance of living. In reality, they believed he had none. From one of the world's greatest riders to a dying man, Armstrong's future was bleak. Well, at first I was, I was so surprised that I didn't believe it. I thought I was going to die. To live the nightmare that I, I lived, um, it doesn't, I've been to hell and back. I realized the importance of me winning the tour, or me trying to win the tour, what it does uh, for everybody involved for the cancer community, for the team, for my family, for my friends. Uh, it's fantastic. Hey, it's, you gotta be brave and you gotta be strong. And uh, anything is possible. Hello and welcome to our coverage of the 86 Tour de France. I'm Phil Liggett and joined in commentary by Paul Schoen. Well, after last year's sensational Tour de France, who knows what we can expect this time around. Here, the start being made outside of the Chateau of the Puy de Fou. The riders facing up to just over three weeks of cycling and almost 2,500 miles. Well, even before a wheel has turned in anger, big names are not in the Tour de France. Out is last year's winner, Marco Pantani. Out to the two previous winners in Jan Ulrich and Bjarne Ries. And in fact, the Tour de France, for the first time in almost 50 years, has no rider in it who's won the Tour de France before. Anyway, this is the route they face. And this time it's a clockwise direction around the hexagon of France. The riders going north to Amiens, then across uh, down the bottom of Luxembourg and Belgium before dropping due south to the Alps, then a journey across the Pyrenees, and then it's due north through Bordeaux, Futuroscope and on to Paris. In all, 3,690 kilometres of cycling and the last man to start of the 180 in this prologue over 6.8 kilometres, Paul, the best finisher of a year ago, Bobby Julik. Finished third in the Tour de France last year. He hasn't had a great season so far, Phil, because he's based everything on this month. The Tour de France, he wants to be the American winner. So, a few deep breaths, Sir Julik is away, and he's chasing, in fact, the names like Lance Armstrong, Abraham Olano, and this is the arrival of Christophe Moreau. The time which has stood right throughout the day, that by Rick Verbrugge, is about to be beaten, and it's coming late in the day. Christophe Moreau has pulled out a good one here, comes up to the line, 8.16, that's the new leaderboard, 8.17.48. Fifth last year in the opening time trial of the Tour de France, but the man doing great times out on the course, Phil, is Lance Armstrong, wearing 181. He's got the fastest time at half distance. Well, he really is flying, Paul, and he looks so good here, making his big return to the Tour de France. He hasn't been here for a couple of years because of his illness, but he's back now. This is the man sweeping up at the back of the field. He's up towards the climb of the Côte du Fossé now. And this is the world champion, Abraham Olano, sandwiched between them and also looking very good at the checks. All the big names out on the course now. Chris Borman as well, the winner. Three occasions of the prologue time trial at the Tour de France. He, too, is out on the course now. This is the right-hand bend. You have to take this at full bore 50 kilometers an hour and try and keep the momentum on the first part of this climb 
A massive crowd here. This is the place to watch the prologue. There's no doubt about that as they see the riders in full flight. Back to the finishing line now. The best time in is Christophe Moreau. And I don't think that Pavel Tonkov is going to approach that. He's still a fair way to go down this straight. There's the best time. And Tonkov is not going to be happy with this, Paul, because he's trained specifically for this race. His goal is a lot longer down the road. In fact, he's looking at the end of the three weeks to try and climb high up in the overall rankings. Not a great prologue by him. Eight minutes, 30 seconds, losing about 23 seconds. But Alex Zuller's got a great time. He's coming up to the line now. Now, zuller has been out for eight months, uh, suspension for taking EPO. He's back. He had a bad tour of Italy, but it looks like he's come out fighting here today. Zuller's on a great time. All of the best time checks, 8.09 at the line, the new leader. Well, at half distance, in fact, Phil Lance Armstrong was one second ahead of him. This is Bobby Julik now on the Côte de Fosse. You can see how difficult this climb is. Julik is out of the saddle. It is a tough climb, and especially on a low-profile machine, and it doesn't look as if Julik is too comfortable out on the road. Oh, well, Chris Borman now finishing behind Zula. Zula was a good marker for him, but Chris hasn't got the better in this time. It's a long way down this straight here at the Puy de Fou. So Borman, the winner of the prologue last year, he's done it three times in all. He's not going to do it this time. He's dropped away from it. 8.17, 8.18.46. That's a bad time for Chris. He won't be happy with that. He's based his season on winning the prologue. The man wearing number 51, Olana, out on the course. But Armstrong is here, and Armstrong is well inside the time of Alex Zula. Well, he's been scorching it all the time, checks. What a comeback this could be. There's only two men behind him now. Armstrong is the leader, and we'll have to wait. 8, 2.5. That is astonishing. Unbelievable, Phil. 50.7 kilometres now. That's nearly 32 miles an hour. Abraham Alano, the time trial champion of the world, is outside the time of Lance Armstrong, so I don't think anybody is going to beat him. Well, there's only, in fact, one rider left now, and Julik has been behind at all of the time checks. Alano hasn't done it either. And here is the last man on the course, round the bottom turn. Now it's a headwind finish, and it's not going to be a winning time. Lance Armstrong has made a magical return to the Tour de France. There's the time of Julik, already outside of that of Lance Armstrong. Remember that Julik lost his time trial a year ago in Dublin by just five seconds on Chris Borman. It's going to be a lot more than that now, as Julik suffers towards the line. The clock is counting away from Armstrong. Armstrong will be the first Mayo Jean of the Tour de France as Bobby Julie comes over in 8.30.75, 28 seconds slower than Lance Armstrong. Well, that's an incredible start to the Tour de France, Phil. He's back at the camping car. Everybody's there to congratulate him. Frankie André, who is eighth Tour de France, the captain of the team, and Johan Brunil, the team manager. I don't think he could have believed that before the start of this tour. Well, what a start for Brunel. Injurain did 8 minutes, 12 seconds over this course in 1993, and now Lance has gone 10 seconds quicker. Zuller, by the way, finished second to Injurain, 8 seconds slower. Now he's finished second to Armstrong, 7 seconds slower. So at least he stays consistent. But this is the new wearer of the Maillot Jaune, the first wearer indeed of this year's Tour de France. Lance Armstrong gets the yellow jersey ahead of Zuller, Alano and Morrow. Let's now go to Gary Imlach, who is interviewing Lance Armstrong at the finish. Congratulations, what a way to announce your return to the tour. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I'm so, right now I'm so surprised, but yet I'm so pleased and so, uh, so happy for the team and for the staff and the other riders. It's, it's of course it's a big story, but uh, for the moment we're, we're, we're so pleased. It's, it's unbelievable. You say surprised, seven seconds over the second place man over less than seven kilometers. That is pretty surprising going. Yeah, I mean, that's all I know. I don't know the time. So uh, I saw, I didn't look at my time the whole, the whole course. And then uh, I knew before I started the best time was 8.20. And I came across the line and I saw right around eight minutes. And I thought, yeah, maybe that's, it can't be right. But of course, I, uh, I gave everything and I felt good. Well, you certainly proved that, Lance, and the leader of the Tour de France now by seven seconds, Le Puy de Fou, the capital of the folklore of the Vendée, has certainly been kind to Lance Armstrong today. The next stage for them, 208 kilometers now from Montague to Chalons. The Tour de France has wasted no time in finding itself a new hero, and from Montague this morning, it's the American Lance Armstrong on their Independence Day who will lead this race away. 
Well, what a big difference a year has made. Last year, we regularly brought reports of police raids on the event and riders being involved in drug scandals. Now, that problem is still with us, evidenced by the fact that some big names are not here, but the news media is here as well as the sports media. Well, of course, we hope the next three weeks will see an end to all of that, but it's been a lot happening this past year. And first of all, before we go to the action, let's go to Gary Imlach to bring us right up to date. It started with an arrest. Festina team masseur Willy Vert caught at the French-Belgian border with a carload of the performance-enhancing drug EPO. Nine days later, the world's top team, led by France's favourite rider, Richard Véronque, were thrown out of the race. Another six left in protest, including the Dutch TVM squad after their hotel was raided by police. And for a few dramatic hours on stage 17, when the riders brought the entire race to a halt, it looked as though it might never restart. By the time Italy's Marco Pantani claimed victory in Paris, along with fewer than half the riders who'd started, it was clear that the end of the tour wouldn't be the end of the matter. And so it's proved, with a number of criminal inquiries still in progress and several big names involved. Casino rider Rodolfo Massi is accused of trafficking. Alfe's team doctor Nicolas Terrados of doping. From Festina, Willy Vert, manager Bruno Roussel, Dr Eric Reichardt and Richard Veronque are all under investigation. Most of Vironque's teammates eventually admitted drug use, served bans and are now riding again. But Vironque denies everything, despite increasingly detailed allegations from Willy Vert, who's published a book complete with pages from the drug dosing diary he kept at Festina. Among other visitors to the investigation headquarters in Lille, have been some of the most powerful men in cycling. Jean-Marie Leblanc, director of the Tour, and Hein Verbruggen, head of cycling's international ruling body, the UCI, have both been asked how much they knew of any abuse and whether they could have done more to fight it. <laughs> Certainly, they're trying now. In January, the UCI announced quarterly medical tests for all riders, albeit administered by their teams, along with surprise tests of their own, both in and out of competition, and increased penalties for any transgressors. French Federation launched a long-term programme to keep tabs on every aspect of a rider's health, and team sponsors drew up their own anti-doping charter. The tour added a moral condition to qualification. Les organisateurs se réserveront le droit de récuser jusqu'au départ de l'épreuve tout coureur et toute équipe qui porterait atteinte à l'image et à la réputation du Tour de France pour fait de dopage notamment. Still, not everyone seemed to get the message. Quelle puissance! Quelle force! Extraordinaire! In May, the world number one Frank van den Broek was arrested over his association with a Paris horse doctor accused of doping. Also on the doctor's list of patients, Richard Veronque, who was fined by his new team Polti, but allowed to ride the Giro d'Italia. Which brings us to the real shocker, Marco Pantani, defending champion of both the Giro and the Tour, thrown off the race for an abnormally high red blood cell count. In this moment, I would like to give a little respect e un saluto ai tifosi e mi dispiace solo per il ciclismo. Pantani and Vandenbroek saved the tour organizers the agony by ruling themselves out of this year's race. But that still left some tough decisions. L'équipe TVM Farfrit est dans son ensemble récusée. Le coureur Richard Viranc n'est pas le bienvenu cette année dans le Tour de France. As well as Vironque and TVM, the final exclusion list had on it Philippe Gaumont and Laurent Roux, who've both been banned for drugs, Anthe's team Dr Nicolas Tarados, and manager Manolo Saiz, who'd lambasted the tour organisation as he led his team out of the race last year. And that should have been that, except that Polti and Anthe both appealed to the UCI, citing a dusty old rule about how much notice they should have been given of their exclusion. The UCI listened with the rapt attention of an organisation scared to death of being sued and promptly applied the letter of the law at the expense of the spirit. Reluctantly, the tour had to admit both Saiz and Veronque, whose arrival at this year's race looked depressingly similar to his departure from last year's. On the face of it then, a bit of a mess, but at least it's a public mess and if all the debate and scrutiny contributes towards cleaning up the sport, then it will also have been a useful mess. Certainly yesterday's blood checks on all 180 riders were a useful step forward, and you can bank on there being plenty more of those as the race continues. And talking of the race, let's get on with today's. 
Well, Gary, it's been a typical day in the first stage of the Tour de France here. A long breakaway by Thierry Gouvenou, 124th after the prologue, and he's been out front by over six minutes. He's been caught now, inside three kilometres to go, and the sprinters are going to have their say. And the sprinters at the moment are being led at the front by the men in the red jersey. That's the Seiko Cannondale team of Mario Cipollini. Second place, in fact, is the Italian champion, Salvatore Comessa. But these guys really know how to put Mario Cipollini into orbit, and they want him to get the first stage here, Phil. But what we are seeing today, Paul, is no real organisation by all of the teams here. And it's not the old red guard of Cipollini. We've got three of them here. Normally we have five or six of them. And it seems to be more or less a free-for-all here as the sprinters try to get through. A lot of chaos there. You can see riders moving up around the outside. A lot of work at the front has been done by the Francais de Jure. The new French sprinter, Jimmy Casper, will also be looking to get himself in the final 200 metres. Well, the French are pinning a lot of hopes on this young man. He's very rapid. This is his first Tour de France. Because of his good sprinting and winning, he's been put in the team here. He's not expected to go the distance, but he's expected to win a stage in this opening week. Now the rider is swarming up for the line. The casino rider on the front at the moment. And now as they start to run through here now, on the far right there, the white jersey of Henk Vogels trying to pick up Stuart O'Grady. O'Grady wants the green jersey this year, and he said so. Eric Zabel's going to give him trouble, though. Zabel tucked in off to the left of our picture. Right in the middle, though, it's Cantina Tolo. They're trying to sort the sprint out for their man, Nicola Minali. In the middle there is Christophe Capella, the rider from Big Matt, and Jay Sweet riding his first Tour de France, the Big Matt Aubert Australian rider. So round that right hand, a lot of riders lost position there now as the team domestiques lost the leaders and one that's gone out of the wrong way is Henk Vogels looking for now Stuart O'Grady, he's not there. That looks like the cruise of the Big Matt team opened up, but he hasn't got Capel on his wheel and the white jersey of Vogels hasn't got O'Grady on his wheel. So this is all going wrong for the lead-out men at the moment. Capel is in third place and just behind him is Kersey Poo in the Estonian Championship jersey, which he's won for a second year, by the way. Now as Magnus Backstick leads out, as he tries to find his teammate O'Grady there, wasn't around. Now coming on the far right, Jan Kersibu is having a go. A big challenge coming too from Tom Steele's on the left. It's Kersibu Steele's for the line and trying to get in on terms. Cipollini is out of this one as Kersibu takes it on the line. They said he wasn't a man for the big occasion. Well, he is now, but he hasn't done enough to win the leader's yellow jersey. But he's done enough to win the stage. Magnificent performance by Jan Kersipu. He really came through out of nowhere. You can see on the left-hand side a big challenge from Tom Steeles. On the right-hand side there is Eric Zabel. He's looking at the points jersey and he doesn't seem to have the zip that he had a couple of years ago. So victory then to Jan Kersipu. And what a great one as he stands on the podium with his first ever stage win in the Tour. Jan, this area has uh, always been very successful for you, but did you think you had a chance to win the Tour de France today? I thought about it yes all the whole the day already and especially when I saw the res results of the yesterday's prologue I saw that I was uh, the best uh, sprinter I did the, the best uh, time among the sprinters so I thought it's maybe a sign for today Yes, and a very good finish indeed, but not quite good enough for the yellow jersey. He's still down the way a little bit. Lance Armstrong keeping his advantage of 7 seconds over Alex Zula and 11 over Abraham Alano. It's great to win the yellow jersey, but actually to ride throughout the stage of the Tour de France wearing yellow must have been a special day for you. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's uh, like I said a minute ago. It was, I was so nervous this morning. I thought I was, you know, I thought I didn't have my bike shoes or, or my helmet or something. But uh, in the race, it was I felt more comfortable. So two days in yellow for Lance Armstrong, leading Alex Zula by seven seconds, and Abraham Olano, 11 seconds in third place. Christophe Moreau, after his great time trial, is fourth, and Boardman Saint for him, he lies in fifth place. Jan Kersipu is the sprinter, he's 16 seconds off the pace. And it's good to see Stuart O'Grady's name on the list as well. Now they're facing up to stage two from Chalons to Saint-Nazaire, and this will be another flat ride across the bridge. This morning, the low conditions are still overcast, no sign of rain yet yet as the riders now say goodbye to the Vendée and they head up to Saint-Nazaire. Basically this is a flat course but it does have some unusual features and this morning Gary Inlac was out early to have a look at one of them. Phil this is the 84 kilometer mark of today's stage at least we think it is because to be honest the road markings are a bit hard to make out. And that's because the road is a bit hard to make out submerged as it is several feet beneath the Atlantic this is the Passage du Gois, which connects the Ile de Noirmoutier and the French mainland. First crossed in 1766 on horseback, as commemorated by a plaque on the wall of the local CAF. 
and ever since by a variety of other means. Only at low tide though, because this is the Wimbledon of local access roads, the covers only come off for about four hours a day, which makes time in the supermarket run a crucial issue for the islanders. There are a series of safety platforms along the 4.5 kilometre route just in case the tide turns against you, but you'd be hard pressed to get the weekly shop up there with you, let alone a family saloon. Plenty of people have made it across though, including the German army in 1940, and the tour itself the last time the race started in this part of France six years ago. On today's route, the riders will head out to the island via the modern bridge, and conditions permitting, back along the cobbled causeway to the mainland. If the tour organisers have read their tide tables properly, we should have some pretty spectacular shots along here later on. If not, it'll be a quick ring round for Charlton Heston's agent's number. Back to Phil. <laughs> Thanks, Gay. Let's hope the tide's out by the time we get there. The rollout, 110 miles today from Chalons. These are the principal players at the moment. Mariano Piccoli in Polka Dot, King of the Mountains. Lance Armstrong starting his second full day in yellow. And on the right here, Jan Kersipu. A dream start for the Tour de France for Lance, but I have to tell you one thing, Phil, he's going to get really challenged today by Jan Kersipu, who's only six seconds off. But at the Passage of Gua, Armstrong is going into that area there in second position. He's riding very well. Well, they've raced flat out here to be sure they got onto this narrow road and saw the front of it. And you know, Paul, I heard there's something like a crash there, and there it is. It happened at the back of the field, a number of riders are down here. This is a massive pile-up here. His body's all over the place. There's one or two riders down there and injured. I can see a rider from US Postal sitting in the middle of the road there. That looks a bit like Jonathan Vorters. There's another man getting up there as well, riding off. But this has caused a big split in the main field. But Armstrong predicted this, and he's right near the front. There's an awful lot of riders have been delayed here too, and that's Calcaterra from Seiko also. There's a wrestling match going on there. Let's have a look at the crash now. Watch the bottom of your picture here because they start to fall on the left. And because the road is so slippery, I think there's a whole ricochet effect here. What's happened is those first two riders have gone down and the people behind have all panicked. They've touched the brakes and the wheels have locked up. Mario Cipollini wasn't involved because he's at the front in this small group. There is the green jersey of Jan Kersipu. Magnus Baxted is there as well for Credit Agricole. And there is the yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong with a good teammate, George Hincapie. Well, this could be a gift sent from heaven here, Paul, because this is a small group of about 12 or 13 riders. Uh, trapped in that back group are some of the big players. Alex Zula was involved in that fall, uh, so too is Michael Bogart, two principal players. Look how the field is split up here. Now, remember, we are 84 kilometres covered now of a 176-kilometre day, so they've got chance to recover. There's still 110 kilometres to go to the finish now. Hincapie's moving to the front, putting the hammer down there. He'll be happy to see that his man, Lance Armstrong, in the yellow jersey's got across this area in safe conditions. But Race Radio Phil telling us one more serious member in that break, in that accident there. In fact, Ivan Gotti too has gone down, the winner of the recent Tour of Italy. Well, as far as we know, most are up and riding. There has been a call for the ambulance, but most seem to be on the way now as the riders start to exit the Passage du Gois. Well, the last time we came across here was 1993, and now a little group has formed at the front. It's swelled somewhat, Paul, but still missing here as we head towards the Pont de Saint-Nazaire in the distance there. That itself, by the way, is a fourth category climb. We're now approaching 166 kilometres, and the gap is growing. Unbelievable. There are 75 riders in this group, and although Alex Zuller's Bonesto team really chased hard to try and limit their losses, they held it at 30 seconds for a long time, Phil, but the last official time check we had was, in fact, they're more than four minutes behind this leading group of riders. Well, they've worked so hard in this breakaway. The chase, I think, has gone off at the back now because they're very dispirited. There's three good riders caught back there, Bogart, Gotti and Zula. This has been a terrible day for them as they go over the Pont de Saint-Nazaire. Once over the top of this, it's only 10 kilometres down to the finish. And here's Gotti here now, number 61. They are losing huge time. A lot of riders losing big time today. There's Manuel Beltran, but at the finish, it's a big lead-out coming for Eric Zabel, and this is Stefan Weserman right on the front. And this is a huge gap as well for this breakaway group. What a gift now as Lars Mikkelsen goes for it, and Jan Kersipu is there now. Well, he's done so well today. He's won all of the sprint bonuses. He's racing for the yellow jersey now. Armstrong safely in the pack. He's gaining time over his rivals. Mikkelsen looks over, waiting for somebody else. Jimmy Casper goes on the far right now. Casper makes it. Martinello tries to grab his wheel. Zabel is there too in the pink top but here comes Mario Cipollini on the far right now and poor Jimmy Casper's gone far too soon off on the left now as Tom 
comes Steels, comes and Kersey Poo tries, Steels gets it. Steels on the line and uh, right alongside in there was Mario Cipollini. But it was a close finish, Steels gets the win, but Kersey Poo should get the yellow jersey. He certainly should, he put in a great sprint all day and this is how it was won. You can see Jimmy Casper in the white there, he panicked, that's the sign of youth coming out the outside there on the white jersey. That is Tom Steeles, the big sprinters right alongside him, Mario Cipollini and Eric Zaba. When it comes to the kick though, Phil, I have to say Tom Steeles really has it. Superb finish by Steeles, he won four stages of the Tour last year, don't forget, and now he's opened his account very early on indeed because the former Belgian national champion gets his win. But this man has got the yellow jersey now. He leads the tour by just a few seconds, 14 to be precise. And this is the main field coming in. Look at the clock at the right, because Zuller and co have lost an awful lot. And Mark Wouters, he was injured in the crash and, in fact, uh, stopped a few miles down the road. And so, too, sadly, did Jonathan Waters of US Postal. And I think this is a rider on great form who's sadly going to be missed by Lance Armstrong. Let's have a look at the overall situation. There it is. Now we can go to Paul again. Lance, once again, the Tour de France proved that you have to be attentive on every stage. Because yeah. anything can happen. Stefan! Yeah. yeah, it's... It's, uh, it's a tough race and it's three weeks and, you know, the, it's always the first week. Everybody hates the first week. It's dangerous, it's nervous. And uh, you have guys that, that are only going to be here a week or ten days, and, and they're, you know, they're normally classics guys, and they like the wind, and they like the flat roads. And you mix them in with guys who want to win the Tour de France and have to wait ten days for the mountains and the time trials. And when they come together sometimes, the mix is, is uh, dangerous for the, for the overall, and, and, and today was a good example. Well, this is the next stage they face now, a little bit shorter, 194 kilometres, 178 riders left in, just the two crash victims out of the tour at the moment to swing into the last kilometre here. And the rider who's gone down there, Moreno Di Biesi, Paul, this is coming down to a bunch sprint again, but it was a dangerous right hander, that. Everyone taking risks. Everybody wants to stay at the front at this moment. The man right on the front, though, is the champion of Holland. There's De Biasi down on the ground. He looks OK. They've taken his bike. In fact, the police may have taken his bike back down to the police station, but he should be up and riding very shortly. On the front is Martin Denbacher, obviously leading the sprint out for Robin McCune, who's up there in the orange and white jersey in third place. Well, sadly for Dibiezi, he was outside the kilometre there, so he's losing time while he's on the floor, but I believe he's now up and riding. As we see the riders head down towards the line here, this again is being a very, very difficult lead-out sprint. On the front is still the Dutch champion Martin Dembacker. They're hoping that Robin McEwen can produce the goods here because they've lost uh, potentially their race leader because of that crash a couple of days ago in the Passage du Bois of uh, Michael Bogert, and that really is sad. A lot of riders in white jerseys up near the front there. That's the Francais de Jure. They want to try and get a win for Jimmy Casper, 21 years of age, the darling of France. He's the sprinter they want to take over. And coming up to the front now, as always, Phil, at the end of these stages, the pink and white jerseys of Team Telecom. That is the team of Eric Zabel. But they're talking to each other. They don't want to lead out just right now. They want to wait a little longer. And in this field, too, don't forget, is the new leader of the tour now, Johan Kersipu. He pulled out the six-second win bonus of Fader Breton right out at the start this morning after only 23 kilometres. So he's building himself a lead in this race. Now, can he finish it off with another stage win? He'd be pretty happy if he could because his lead now at the moment is 20 seconds over Lance Armstrong and he has proved he's a very good sprinter. There's a lot of misunderstanding between these teams, Phil. The Seiko Cannon Teal riders are looking over their shoulders. They want to know where Mario Cipollini is. Look out for the green jersey because wearing the green jersey today, in fact, is Tom Steeles. He's not leading that competition, but in second place, he's right near the front as well. Well, all of the teams have got their sprinters and domestics trying to break this up. There's no actual liaison between the rides at all this year. None of the standard leads out we normally see. As they now start to open up for the line here, it looks as though Telecom might have themselves a little bit organised. This is a very good finish here in Laval. First time the race has come here for the finish now. As again, Casper in the middle as he tries to go. Van Bon is leading out, but he hasn't found Robbie McEwen on his wheel. And that is highlighting the disorganisation in these teams now as the Les Francais du Jeu team tries to get their man Jimmy Casper up there, he's fourth wheel at the moment, Lars Mikkelsen is giving him a good lead out, Casper's got his wheel, Mikkelsen giving everything here now, McEwen trying to come through, it isn't going to work out because again, watch out for the green jersey of Steels. he spotted the line and he's gone for it, what a finish here by Tom Steels. Judo Grady challenged him all too late, Tom Steels has got two wins out of two, what a finish. 
Well, Tom Steele's Phil is proving he's the fastest sprinter in this Tour de France. The team are not helping him at all, but once he finds the gap, he goes straight through it. And as you see, Eric Zabel again is close to the win, but just can't quite make it. The riders in the Tour de France are always under pressure. The last thing Jackie Giron wanted was a slap in the face from his own team car. <laughs> and let's hope he didn't damage the machine either, because one of those lotto bikes is our competition prize this week. And if that wasn't enough, poor Jackie was almost run over by a rival team car. In the end, with pain a part of his daily life in the Tour, the Frenchman continued and is currently 170th overall. But when your luck's in, it's really in. And the Belgian Tom Steele celebrated in grand style his second stage win at the Tour in Laval yesterday. If he can make it three in a row today, he equals the 51 years old record of the Italian Gino Bartoli. So can he? I hope so. <laughs> well, he shouldn't lack confidence because he's never sprinted better in his life. And the course today, the same distance as yesterday, 194 and a half kilometers. But there are some great sprinters in this year's Tour de France. So let's go to Paul Sherwin now, who will assess the form of the men who think they can beat him. Mario Cipollini would be a good bet to beat Tom Steeles. He was fuming after the finish yesterday. He'd been in an ideal position to win. In one of the last corners, he was forced off his line and another rider tried to climb over his back wheel. He lost his place in the pack. Super Mario loves the headlines and he'll try and grab them again today. Eric Zabel has been consistently near the front of the pack since the start of the tour. He'd love to win today, it's his birthday. But he seems to have lost a bit of his speed and hasn't won a stage in the Tour de France since 1997. New kid on the block is Jimmy Casper. He's cocky and confident enough to win. At 21 years of age though, he's still learning. But if he can get a clear shot at the line, he'll show them his pure speed. His frustration at losing yesterday was evident, and he banged his handlebars in rage and disappointment. Jan Kersifu is the most successful rider of the current season with 15 wins. He's already shown he's one of the fastest sprinters at the Tour, but he's using a lot of energy to hold on to the yellow jersey, and his focus is not totally on winning the stage. Stuart O'Grady is not a real sprinter like Eric Zabel or Mario Cipollini, but he's determined and courageous enough to hold his place with the big boys. If anyone makes a mistake in the last 300 metres, O'Grady will be ready to pounce. All of those riders are going to be up to beat Tom Steeles today, but if it does come down to a sprint at the end, it's a one kilometre straight road up to the finish line, and Seiko Cannondale are the ideal team to put Mario Cipollini into orbit. If it is going to be a sprint, I reckon Mario's going to win. Confident Paul show in there, 177 riders left in the race, so 194 kilometres the distance today as we go from the Val to Blois. And uh, a nice gentle rollout, Paul, but this race hasn't wasted any time at all so far. Jackie Durand on the front there, but it's a very fast stage. You can see the average over the first couple of hours of the day, 50.3 kilometres an hour. Well, we're into the last kilometre now here at Blois, and again it's Mike Weissman who looks over his shoulder and sees if he's got his man on his wheel, and he hasn't, and he gives up sprinting because of it. Zabel again hasn't done anything about it, but this man's got Cipollini on his wheel, and a perfect lead out now. This will be uh, Jean Matteo Fagnini who's taking uh, now Cipollini, shown in the finish. He's gone for it. Cipollini is towing the best sprinters towards the line, but you'll never get by this man when he has such a clear shot at the finish line, and he's being challenged right by Zabel again. Zabel beaten and right on the line Mario Cipollini is back Super Mario give him a finishing straight like that Phil and nobody is going to come past him when he's in flow, full flow and again Eric Zabel's there but the speed is gone he must be feeling very frustrated and again O'Grady getting into the frame but Mario Cipollini he looks so cool when he wins there's the result ahead of Zabel O'Grady Tom Steele's this time having to be content with fourth place and looking further down Kersi Poo all of the sprinters getting through and finding the Lion King was roaring the best here on the road to Blois today on the podium then his first victory in the stage in the Tour de France this year and now looking much more confident. Overall, though, Kersipu keeps his yellow jersey 16 seconds ahead of O'Grady, 21 ahead of Steeles, and Lance Armstrong, the first leader, has only dropped down to fourth in amongst the sprinters. There's plenty of more racing to come.
50.355 kilometres an hour in the Tour de France yesterday, a record average speed, the first time the riders have ever beaten 50 kilometres an hour for a road race. In fact, that's the speed we're driving along at the moment to give you some idea. Even in the town of Blois, the riders were exceeding the speed limit and Mario Cipollini is the man that won the day. Let's go to Gary Imlac now to tell us more about an extraordinary day in the Tour de France. You know, yesterday's stage was so fast, it was a day early, because for purposes of perfect symmetry, the new record really should have been set here in Amiens, where the old one was. In 1993, Johan Brunel clocked just under 49 and a half kilometers on the stage from Evreux to Amiens. And there was no peloton to help pull him along either, just a cooperative westerly wind at his back. As the crowd start to applaud him, and then the clock will tell us whether, in fact, he's done enough to wear the yellow jersey tonight, that's why he's fighting all the way to the line. He crosses the line as the winner. If Cipollini Funnily enough, the next man in behind him that day was Mario Cipollini, winning the sprint for second place and taking the yellow jersey. Yesterday, the roles were reversed. Like everyone else, Brunel was behind Cipollini in the support car of the US Postal team, where he's now manager. Uh, it was logical. Uh, it was a very, very strong tailwind, and uh, the records are uh, set to be, to be broken. So uh, yesterday it happened. Uh, the good thing of the, of the part is that uh, it was broken by Cipollini. When I set the record, he was second. So uh, I'm not there anymore now. He has the record now. And as it turned out, he'd set it despite the weight of a huge chip on his shoulder. 32 years old and in the final year of a lucrative contract with Saeco, Mario revealed after the stage that he'd been unable to agree terms with his old team for next season. Ma è, è la sensazione quando hai magari un bel Mercedes però 6.000 di cilindrata, è uscito il modello nuovo e la gente magari opta per il modello nuovo che ha sicuramente caratteristiche inferiori al vecchio modello. Of course, even an old Mercedes will still leave a field of Ford Escort standing as Mario's already demonstrated this year with four stage wins in the Giro d'Italia to bring his total to a record 29. Lamprey and Cofidis are rumoured to be among the teams willing to offer the old clothes horse a costume change for next season, with colour scheme probably just behind cash and length of contract as a deciding factor. In the meantime, two big questions remain. Does having a picture of Pamela Anderson on your handlebars qualify as an artificial stimulant? And the obvious follow-up question that he no doubt gets asked at home. Mario, perché non hai una fotografia della moglie sul suo manubrio? Grazie. Ma eh, mia moglie me la ricordo bene anche senza dover fare le foto. Now, can he do it? A breakaway of 10 riders has been caught after a long move, but it came to nothing. Now we're going down to another sprint finish, Paul. On the front again, Cantila Toller. They want to get it together for Nicola Minali, but always the white jersey of the Australian champion, Henk Vogels, is there. He's trying to get a stage win as well for Stuart O'Grady, who's been very consistent. Francais de Jure right in the middle, picking it up. That's Christophe Bassin. But right behind him, the three red and white jerseys of the Psycho Cannondale team, and that's Mario Cipollini's boys. Well, Cipollini's tail is really up now after he got his first win yesterday. Once this man gets confidence, he's very difficult to dislodge. Everybody seems to be looking for the wheel of Mario Cipollini, and that's the one to follow now. Again, the last lead out from Fagnini now as he goes as fast as he can. Cipollini just sits there as cool as you like, Lars. Miggleson tries to challenge as well. Zorbel again just off to our left. There was a nasty switch on the right-hand side there. Cipollini wasn't involved, though, as he comes clear now, launched into space. On the far left, Zorbel has his best chance ever, though. Zorbel goes for it now. Cipollini and coming is Tom Steels. Steels comes past Zorbel, but on the line, Cipollini makes it two in a row, and right behind him was Tom Steels. What a finish again. Unbelievable. Super Mario, he's pretty happy with that. Everyone said he'd lost his speed, but look at this. He saw, sees the sprint on the right-hand side. It comes from Eric Zabel, and he realises that's the moment he has to move. He kicks it in. He's got the big gear going. Gian Matteo Fanini sits up and lets him go by. And Mario Cipollini, Phil, he's come back to the Super Mario he was before. And I tell you what, he loves to look over his shoulder to see how far behind him everybody was in the sprint. Well, Zabel just went too soon. It looked as though he had the speed, but he faded. And then when he faded, Cipollini won. And coming in there in third place, the yellow jersey of Jan Kersipu. So he gets a useful few seconds bonus as well. Behind Cipollini and Steels. Robbie McEwen not quite there yet. Fourth place for him. Zabel faded to fifth. So two out of two for Cipollini. He's now looking at the possible uh, equaling of Bartoli's record of 51 years ago. But no change overall. Kersipu 17 seconds ahead of 
Andrew Steeles, 24 on O'Grady and 32 on Lance Armstrong. The Tour de France reached the Somme on the beauty of the Picardy yesterday. Playboy Italian Mario Cipollini started his day in beach mode and then he finished it in full flight to take his second win in a row. Two days ago, the star sprinter was Tom Steeles and Super Mario was ending but Now, having won the fastest stage ever in a Tour de France on Wednesday, Cipollini has his sights on Gino Bartoli's 51 years old record of three wins in a row. It could happen today. Well, you just can't suppress Mario Cipollini, and if things go well for him tonight, he could be in the leader's yellow jersey too. He's now the second rider this week to have a shot at Gino Bartoli's 1948 record of three stage wins in a row. He's got Imlac now to look at the opportunity for big Mario to put his name in the record books for the second time this week. Mario has never actually finished a tour and has never won a stage past the traditional sprinter's territory of the first week. However, he is the best sprinter of his generation, and a win today would put him alongside one of Italy's greatest cycling heroes. As soon as yesterday's stage was over, he was already thinking about it. Sarebbe, sarebbe una bella cosa fare tre vittorie consecutive. Mi sembra che sia già qualche, qualche anno fa che non avviene. Perciò sono uno che, che è adatto a battere i record. Speriamo che questa sia una cosa possibile. Actually, Chippo already has a hat trick of sorts in the bag because this is the third year running that he scored consecutive wins. In 97, he took stages one and two before Eric Zabel beat him on an uphill finish in Plumelec. Last year, it was stages five and six, which turned out to be bad timing because stage seven was a time trial where he was never really likely to challenge for the win. This year could be his best ever chance. Mind you, if he's feeling the pressure, he's certainly not showing it. Chippo spent most of yesterday working on his tan lines and reenacting his favorite episodes of Benny Hill. When it comes to the crucial last kilometer, though, he's all business, marshalling his lead-out men from behind to make sure he's in the perfect position when it matters. But I un input that ci vuole dalle spalle, è soltanto il fatto di riuscire a capire se sono a ruota. Io io chiamo Fagnini, Fagnini chiama Mario e quello è il momento che siamo tutti siamo tutti in linea e li possiamo partire. Diciamo che questo è un meccanismo che non non serve provarlo perché mai da anni che lo facciamo è una cosa come le triangolazioni tra i calciatori ma non. If the Sanko midfield can do their job and spring the offside trap today, the big man should have a clear run at goal. There's no uphill finish like there was in 97 when Eric Zabel beat him, just a two-kilometre home straight. This finish could have been tailor-made for Chippo in Milan and couriered out specially for the occasion. <laughs> Indeed it could, Gary. Well, they're rolling away again. 171 kilometres now from Amiens to Maubeuge, and uh, Cipollini is aiming for that 51-year-old record of Gino Barti, at least to equal the great Italian maestro. Quite a few riders in the field could challenge him, but Jans Verrada, who at the moment rides for Lamprey, his team are leading out right on the front. In the second position there is Mariano Piccoli. In fourth position is Jans Verrada. Eric Zabel also would like to prevent Cipollini from winning, Phil, and Eric Zabel is right in there at the moment. And he'd love to win right now. Uh, Piccoli, though, in that polka dot jersey, he's led from day one so far as he heads towards the first mountains of the Alps, but the sprinters are getting their turn again here now. Watch out for Cipollini. He's not in evidence yet as they come towards the line now. There's Cipollini again behind his lead-out man, but all of the boys here on the Lamprey team moving over now as again Fagnini, third day running, is making a run at the line here with Cipollini on his wheel. The yellow jersey of Kersipu is still in there. Six-second time bonus out on the course for him today. Tom Steele, though, has swung right across the course there to grab the back wheel of Cipollini. He's got the back wheel, and Steele is coming over on Cipollini. Shoulder, shoulder, Steele's on the line, but I'm not so sure the judges will like that, Paul. It looked a little bit shaky. A lot of riders diving across the road. The thing is, when you're in a sprint like this, you're looking for the slipstream of the wheel in front. This is the infringement the judges are going to look at, Phil. The green jersey moving across there, just hitting the shoulders of Jans Verrada. Verrada keeping him upright, but that's why Steeles went. He wanted to get onto the wheel of Mario Cipollini. Once he got in there, he got a breather for a fraction of a second and then moves alongside and kicks with that incredible turn of speed he's got in the last 50 metres and moves forward, comes up alongside Cipollini, puts his arm onto Cipollini, Cipollini as well, but in the lunge for the line, there's no problem there. He's first over it, but the judges are discussing it right now. 
Well, let's have another look from the front here. A little bit of a clash of elbows there. Nothing wrong with that, but already Zverada has sat up out of it. A little bit of a wry smile on his face as over the line first comes Tom Steele's in green, Cipollini second, and third over the line again is Eric Zabel with the yellow jersey there of Jan Kersipu just behind. Tom Steeles has been called onto the podium by the race organisation, but almost at the same time as he takes the applause of the crowd here. The referees are saying he has been disqualified from first place and placed to the back of the field for his dangerous sprinting. So, in fact, Cipollini is the stage winner. He's already left the area, by the way, but there is confirmation of the result. Cipollini wins ahead of Zabel, Kersipu and Zverada. So, Kersipu gets another valuable third-place sprint bonus. Tom Steele's at the back of the pack, 170 seconds, so that's pretty low. And so overall now there will be a, an increase in the leadership of Jan Kersipu, who will now lead the tour uh, by 26 seconds ahead of Cipollini. Tom Steele's is third and O'Grady there at 38 seconds. Armstrong losing a bit in the time bonuses here now. He is down to sixth place, 46 seconds off the pace. He won't be too worried about that, I shouldn't think. No, perhaps not, but uh, Mario Cipollini, Paul, if he can win this one over 227 kilometres, he'll become the first man in 69 years since Charles Pellissier, in fact, to win four stages straight. And the sprinters certainly want to have their day because today is the last flat stage before the time trial and then two very big mountain stages, and that's when the sprinters of this year's Tour de France are going to have to take a back seat. U.S. Postal Boys, evidence at the front. There's Tom Steeles chatting with Mario Cipollini. The strange thing was the riders didn't complain about the sprinting of Tom Steeles yesterday, and I think perhaps it was a rather hard decision by the race referees. It's always a difficult time, a sprint, because you only have an eye of what's in front of you. You don't think about what's happening towards the side. You just go for the wheel and you go for the gap. And when you're a sprinter like that, Phil, you just have to take the chance when it comes. So 20 kilometres now win today from the northeast, and the riders themselves again making good time. This tour continues on at record-breaking speed. We've seen that wonderful stage of over 50 kilometres now, won by Cipollini. Now here's a man, records falling in his first week, and they're all going the way of the man in red, and he could well do it again now. A late attack from Rabobank there, but it's not going anywhere at all. It's again going to be the big lead out on the front. Stefan Reisemann from Team Telecom. Behind him, Gian Matteo Fanini. And then in third place, that's Mario Cipollini looking for the big record. Well, this again is Stefan Weissemann who is trying to lead out his man, Eric Zabel, who's in green. Zabel's fourth wheel around the corner. He just can't seem to get it quite right, you know. And he's trying to equal the stage win record of eight by Rudy Altig for Germany. And again, he's a little bit away from it. Now, Weissemann once more doesn't realise it. He's inexperienced, perhaps, in his first talk. Leading out the wrong man, leading out Fanini. Fanini now once more launching the missile at the finish. As again, he waits until the last possible moment, Cipollini. Remember, he's aiming now at a 69-year-old record. Cipollini's gone, and what's happened to Zabel? Lost both his pedals at the same time, and how he's kept that bike upright, I don't know, but he's given a clear run now to Cipollini. He's done it four in a row for Mario Cipollini, but I think I'd like to see what happened to Eric Zabel again there, Paul. That was unbelievable. Both his feet came out of the pedals at the same time. I really don't know how he stayed upright, but this is the kick. In fact, you can see both legs came out. They went behind him. He managed to pull them up, but he never let go of the handlebars, and that's how he managed to control the machine. But that had nothing to do with the win of Mario Cipollini because Cipollini was already in the lead, almost a length ahead of Stuart O'Grady. And once he'd got the chance of that great record, he just put his head down and went to the line. O'Grady had to be happy with second. Yes, poor old Stuart, but at least they all got out of the way of potential crash there from Eric Zabel. As this man just looks over his shoulder, makes it look so easy. He's now got four wins straight, and he's also got the fastest stage ever of the tour this week. Cipollini then winning ahead of O'Grady and Kersipu. Overall, Cipollini still 14 seconds off yellow. This is the launch pad of the individual time trial of the Tour de France. For many of the lesser riders, there's always a sensation of fear when you come in there because you're looking elimination in the face. But for the big names, it's the first time in a week that they have to come out and really put their cards on the table because at the end of the individual time trial that we get an idea of just exactly who's going to win the Tour de France. That's why they call it the race of truth. 
And this man who's surprised at the Puy de Fou in the prologue is at it again here because his checks are very, very quick at the mar at the every mark we go through, Paul. He is rewriting the time checkbook. But this accident out on the course, and this is Bobby Julik. We've heard about it. Now we can get a look at it. Paul Julik has misjudged his right-hander and has gone down very, very badly indeed. This is one of the most dangerous parts of the course, but Armstrong has ridden by him. Armstrong himself realising that he is doing great times out on the course. Boardman set the early times, but now Armstrong goes through here after 33 kilometres with the best time covered. And this is what is happening. Lance Armstrong, it's all coming together again, just like it did on the Puy de Fou. This is a man who really has learned a time trial and he's beginning to embarrass everybody, especially the rider in front of him here because he's pulling back man after man. This looks like George Hincapie. Yeah, his team in fact, Abraham Alana, looks as if he's had a problem going round one of the corners there. He's back up on his machine. He's getting pushed by one of the spectators at the side of the road and he must have lost it in that corner, Phil. Well, I think it's a left-hand corner. He's just got... Oh, we can have a look at it again here now. It's a left-hand corner, completely out of control. There's no way he was going anywhere. He locks up his back wheel. Well, thank heavens there was a straw bale there, but that's uh, called a headstand in front of the public, <laughs> and the world champion is going to be embarrassed about that because, in fact, Armstrong is coming right up behind him. Armstrong is riding an incredible race, starting two minutes behind the world champion at the time trial. He's already got him in, in sight, and this is going to be a double blow, really, to Abraham Alano, the world champion at this discipline. Well, you know, Abraham Alano has never been caught as a professional in a time trial before, and all that is about to change, and Armstrong is the man to do it. Is there no end to this rider this year because Armstrong just can do absolutely nothing wrong? Well, the last time I saw him ride a time trial like this, Phil, was 1996, the Tour du Pont, which he absolutely dominated. He won that time trial stage there at over 32 miles an hour. But he has changed. His position on the machine has changed. He's got a very aerodynamic helmet. But the important thing is that the speed at which he's pedalling, look at that cadence, it's up around 100 RPM. Well, since his cancer therapy and his chemotherapy, he has lost an awful lot of weight in his training, in his comeback. Those that thought after his Paris-Nice race last year that he was going home for good were proved absolutely wrong. This man has waited to come to the Tour de France this year. He's come, and he's come in the biggest way you could imagine. Armstrong is now racing to the best time here as we go back to the finish. And Dufault and Zula is the best time in. We didn't see him finish, but Dufault now 112, only sixth for him. This is great. Look at this. This is Armstrong catching a man who started six minutes in front of him. This is the Belgian sprinter, Tom Steeles, and he's going to get a major shock. Abraham Milano Phil, is fighting to try and stay in contact. Well, if anything, he's gone slightly better since Armstrong caught him. That might be a little bit of pride there, but he's tried to lift his race. Uh, this is Tom Steeles now as Armstrong continues, and Steeles has got no chance here of keeping up, I don't think. Well, I have to say, Phil, I think, in fact, Armstrong is weakening over the last 10 kilometres of this course because he's caught all of the other riders in front of him. He's dropped them very easily, but now Tom Steeles, who is not riding a great time trial, has managed to stay in contact with Armstrong. But look at this time by Morrow. Well, again, Christophe Moreau has shown us what a great time trial rider he is, and he's still surviving up near the top of the leaderboard, too, and this will keep him there. He's only a bit slower than Alex Zula, second at the moment, and a minute, six seconds off the leaderboard. Tom Steele still trying to keep Lance Armstrong in sight at one kilometre to go. Armstrong has set the fastest times at every time check so far, Phil, and some of them have been incredible times. He was almost a minute faster than Alex Zuller, and now he's coming up to the line, and look at that, he's almost a minute faster on the finish line as well. Well, we are going to see a second stage win here and the second time trial win for Lance Armstrong, and he could well be a yellow jersey as well. Armstrong won 8.36, an incredible time. Lance Armstrong has reclaimed the Mayo Jean that he won at the Puy de Fou, and you can say that before the arrival of Abraham Olano, who has been caught for two minutes by Armstrong, and he's just trying to salvage a reasonable time, and it will be around fifth overall on the day. One ten. 58 and fifth for Alano. Unbelievable. Alano looked fantastic in the first kilometres of this time trial. I thought he looked good, but he could do nothing against the onslaught of Lance Armstrong. This man has ridden the time trial at almost exactly the same speed as he rode the opening prologue. That announces it's going to be a pretty impressive ride when we go into the mountains after the rest day.
Well, can he continue? This is unbelievable here. Lance Armstrong, though, the winner of the time trial by almost a minute over Alex Zula. Moreau taking third, but over two minutes off the pace. And Alano even further back. Tyler Hamilton, another good time trial by him at 3.31, although he won't give his all today because he knows now he's going to have to work for Lance Armstrong in the overall race for yellow. Chris Borman, a little bit off the pace there. Sixth for him. So the yellow jersey back on the shoulders of Lance Armstrong one week into the Tour de France. It's an awful long way to go yet, but look at these gaps now. These are sensational time gaps. 2.20 on Christophe Moreau, 2.33 on Alano, 3.25 on O'Grady. The big question is, can his team now support him for two weeks of the Tour de France and keep him in yellow? It's going to take an awful lot of doing and the pressure's on them. Hello and welcome to Tour Plus. Well, after 1,468 kilometres and nine days of racing, the Tour de France has reached the mountains. For some, they are high roads to conquer and bring joy and celebration and the happiest of memories. For others, they bring opposite emotions of pain, sadness and defeat. Since the Puy de Fou, this race has been a fairy tale for Lance Armstrong. Now, having excelled on the flat, does he fear the two days ahead? Coming into the tour, I, uh, I thought, and my coaches and the people on the team thought that uh, that my my strength in the tour would be my climbing and not my time trial. And so, if that holds true, then then uh, then, I'm, then I might be able to hold on. So Armstrong seems ready and confident. This is the overall situation this morning. He leads Christophe Moreau by 2 minutes 20 seconds and Abraham Olano by 2.33. Stuart O'Grady, the Australian, also doing well in fourth. Of the others who should look forward to today, Pavel Tonkov is 13th and 5 minutes 10 seconds back. Alex Zulla, after a good time trial, is creeping back at 7.08. And Chris Borman, he'll have a tough day today but he's still riding the Tour in 123rd position. And the rollout this morning, 173 starters leaving Le Grand Bournemont, destination Sestriere, 213 kilometers of the distance. They are without Jimmy Casper, the La Française des Jeux rider, and Nicola Manali, the sprinter from Cantino Tolo. They decided not to start. Not a great day's racing in store for these riders because the weather is going to be very bad. The clouds will come in with be a serious threat of thunderstorms over the top of the mountains. Not much wind to worry about though, a feebly easterly wind at 15 kilometers an hour. In the valleys the temperature will be 28 degrees Celsius and over the summit of some of the climbs it will drop, drop down to 4 degrees. Sounds like a typical alpine day in high summer to me, Paul. Well, at 15 and a half kilometers the first climb is the Col du Marais. And in fact, three riders just ahead of the field here. Konishev taking it out ahead of Mariano Piccoli and uh, Lilian Le Breton getting in third place there. Then it was on to the Col de Tamier at 38 and a half kilometers. And here's one for the boxer. Piccoli winning the sprint ahead of Konishev and uh, the Rabobank non climber Robin McEwen. So the race yet to start in anger. And uh, then on to the Col de Telegraph. And this is where it all began. The breakaway had started at 64 kilometers. Uh, Piccoli was in it again. Gian Paolo Mondini, uh, Den Bacca, Jose Arieta, and uh, Fabrio Gugo. They were the five men who went clear at 64 kilometers. By the time they got to the top of the telegraph, Arietta was on his own. The rest had all been caught. And it was Richard Bereng taking out the sprint for second place ahead of Laurent Dufo. Now, look at these pictures here. We're on the climb of the Col du Galibier. And in fact, we're seeing here. Uh, Castle Blanco from the Kelme team just trying to spring clear, but further up the road uh, by over four minutes at the moment is Jose Arieta. He was in a group of five, Paul, that went clear as they went on to the Col de Telegraph. They split up there, but he stayed clear. There was no major panic in that leading group of five riders because nobody really a danger to Lance Armstrong's overall lead. The best placed rider, in fact, was a Frenchman. Fabrice Gugo, he was 58, 9 minutes, 57 seconds behind. But Arietta is a good rider, he rides for the Bonesto squad, and that may well be the tactic for the day for Bonesto to launch somebody up the road and set something up a little later for Alex Zuller. Well, sorry about these pictures, but we are having terrible troubles, you can imagine now. We're just having an electrical storm out in the Alps. 
The ride has started to decline in reasonably dry weather, but it's absolutely torrential rain they've just ridden through, and it's continuing. Uh, at the finish of Sestria, the rain has also arrived there now, so the riders look to be in for a wet day. And all this uh, will send out warning signals to all of the riders. Let me tell you immediately, on the Calder Telegraph, a lot of riders in trouble. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised when we say the sprinters, Kersey Poo, Cipollini and Zabal. As we continue to watch the attacks here coming again, it's Escartine who's gone now. So Fernando Escartine, we've seen two of the Kelme boys attack, and now he's having a go, and this is going to have to cause a reaction. They really have put the US Postal boys on the defensive on this climb, because uh, the US Postal, where the pacemaking up the climb of the Telegraph was done by Frankie Andreo, but he paid the price. He's now been dropped by the peloton, and so there's only a couple of guys left around Lance Armstrong now, and these attacks shortly to come. I suppose, though, Paul, going back to the Calder Telegraph, the biggest surprise of the day was the rider drop there, Alexander Vinokurov, and we didn't expect that. Nobody expected that. He was a big favourite. Now, this is what a lot of people did expect, though, on the Calder Galibier, the big attacks. This is Richard Viren going clear now. Another Bonesto rider has come across to Escartine. We had to expect this from the climbers. Escartine 40th in the overall standings, seven and a half minutes behind Lance Armstrong. And Richard Berenk is having a good day now, as uh, he was best of the rest over the top of the Calder Telegraph. Uh, Richard Varenk leading the peloton over sixth, five minutes, 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds, so far, uh, behind uh, Jose Arrieta. Now he's on the attack with Casablanco, Beltran, Escartine, and this is a good group of four climbers going clear. Very good move by Kelme, the green and white jerseys. This team is the longest serving professional team. They've been in the sport now for 20 years. They launched Castelblanco off the front and immediately he had 100 meters. Escartine came shooting out of the pack. Now this is dangerous for Armstrong because you have two riders from the same team in a leading group of four. But I have to say, Richard Viron came across very easily as well. And you can see now rejoining the group of Lance Armstrong, Kevin Livingston is doing an incredible job because he's lifted the pace so high that that group, which just a few mo moments ago was 30 riders, is now down to a very select group of eight or nine. The white jersey on the shoulder of Lance Armstrong there, in fact, is another man who he fears in this Tour de France. It's the Swiss rider Alex Zuller. He's still waiting here. He knows his teammate uh, Arietta is setting the pace. He's about four and a half minutes ahead of these pictures at the moment, Arietta having uh, got rid of Piccoli, uh, Gianpaolo Mondini, Martin Dembaca and Fabrio Gugo. They were the four riders who went with him at 64 kilometers today, and he blasted them all off on the Col de Telegraph. This is Beltran slipping back to the Armstrong group. I'm surprised they dropped him, uh, but certainly once, uh, once Zulla sees this, he'll know he's going to have to be the next one to make a move, I think. This is his teammate, by the way. This, these weather conditions today will actually play into the hands of Lance Armstrong because the Spanish riders spend most of their season riding in very good conditions, nice warm conditions in the Iberic Peninsula. So Armstrong will take advantage from the fact that he knows they don't like this cold weather. The weather on this day's day stage, in fact, is very changeable in the van valleys below the mountains. These riders are at so riding in temperatures of around about 25 degrees Celsius and over the top of the big climbs it drops down to 10 degrees Celsius. So that has a big effect on the muscles. One big man missing from this group is, in fact, Abraham Alano. Now, he's the leader of the uh, Onse squad, and we would have expected him to be able to ride up alongside Lance Armstrong. A terrible mental blow for him the other day when he was caught for two minutes in the time trial by Armstrong, and he, too, is another rider who doesn't like this kind of conditions. The cold and wet climbs, and he is in serious difficulty a long way back down this mountain. Well, this is incredible. This race, first day in the mountains, you can see the conditions the riders are in at the moment. Uh, and we're now looking at the pacemakers here as they keep on the way. But Alano has now been dropped, uh, having been caught for the first time in his time trialing career, now dropped by the Armstrong group. And so they are in serious problems right now. Christoph Morrow also in trouble. He's second overall. So uh, at the moment, Paul, things are going right the way of the American Armstrong. Well, in fact, it's uh, all very much thanks to Fernando Escartine, who launched that incredible attack. And the pressure then by Kevin Livingston to bring it back slowly has eliminated a lot of Armstrong's rivals for the moment. Some other names that are missing just now, and we're looking, I think, in this group, the white jersey of Pavel Tonkov, who started the day 13th overall. He, too, is in desperate difficulty just trying to keep in himself not too far behind on this climb. Uh, Richard Veronque will be quite pleased with his first day in the Alps and maybe planning a big day tomorrow at Alpe d'Huez. A uh, big day any day for a Frenchman in July the 14th. That man makes it look a little bit easier than I think it is to come up uh, 
Egalibier and being told to kindly leave the race course. He doesn't have a number on. Now, Varenk goes over to the right, marked immediately by uh, Fernando Escartin and Jacquim Castelblanco is the rider we're looking at here. They've got the rhythm going now, but that's a group of seven behind, which includes Zulla, Dufault, Livingstone, Beltran, and, of course, the yellow jersey, Armstrong. And the other man there, by the way, is another Kelme rider, and uh, that will be Gomez. And so they've got some good riders in that chase group as well. It's been a marvellous uh, day out for Jose Arieta, who's led over the telegraph. He's led all of the way up the Galibier by himself. And he's going to lead the Tour de France over the Col de Galibier and earn himself the maximum points. He'll also be picking up a couple of thousand pounds because he will win uh, the Honor de, de Grange prize here as being first over the climb today to celebrate 50 years of climbing the Col du Galibier. The crowd, although wet, enjoying to see, uh, seeing the arrival of the leader of the Tour de France today, at least on the road. But Varenk now is also piling on the pressure. Escartine and dropping a little bit. Joachim Casablanco. And there's the reason. Armstrong has ridden brilliantly with Tyler, with um, Kevin Livingstone to bring him back into play here. Varenk saw the return there of the yellow jersey group and he wants to try and get as many points as possible over the summer to this climb for the King of the Mountains competition. That's why he's attacked now. He knows that he's not a major threat to Armstrong at 7 minutes 21 seconds behind him. So he's just hoping that he will be able to get over the top of this climb in second position and earn himself an awful lot of points. But what great riding for the moment by the US Postal Service and Lance Armstrong. Absolutely superb. Jose Arieta is coming up to the summit of the Col du Galibier. There's the summit to the right. Here's a massive crowd cheering him on now. He's been in the lead since 64 kilometers today now. He goes over the top of the Col de Galibier. We have now covered 145 kilometers of a long day in the saddle of 213 in the Alps. And Arietta scores the first big mountain points for Team Bonesto. They'll be pleased about that because they had a rough ride in the Tour of Italy this year and they really do need a good Tour de France, and of course they haven't got on the team anymore, Miguel Ingeré. Now, he's putting on a, another top here, Paul. Another, in fact, he's going to stop and do it. Why, what's the hurry, he says? Sensible move. We've seen so many accidents in the past that Suanyo is sent to the top of the climb to wait for him. But this is the next group coming up. The yellow jersey of Lance Armstrong, and Alex Zuller is right up there behind him, and the pace being met by a brilliant Kevin Livingstone today. He really has ridden wonderfully to pull back the attack by the Kelme boys and Richard Veron. As in fact now Virenk attacks for the King of the Mountains on his shoulder is Dufault. But Virenk gets it and leans heavily on Dufault. Just get, ask, give me a little bit of room here as we start the descent down. So it was Arietta, Virenk a second over the top of the mountains and Laurent Dufault uh, goes over in third place. And the gap on the leader uh, we've made a minute and 40 seconds on Arietta, although he will have lost maybe a little bit. We didn't actually see when he got away after that uh, putting on of the rain top. Alano, big question mark on him now. A big question mark. Can he recover on the descent down to Briançon? The man leading this next group up is a man who I expected to ride well today, Stefano Gazzelli, a teammate of uh, M Marco Pantani and also the winner last year of the Tour of Switzerland. Zelli there has picked up his rain top as well, just kept the pace up while he went over the summit. Now let's see if he can put it on without crashing. Oh my goodness me, I thought he'd gone then as he reached for the handlebars. And Garini, he's going to eat his top, is he? No, he's going to put it on. He's going to gun down the top. These boys are not going to race down, Paul Arley. They're just going to they're conserving themselves. The racing done up the hill and they'll consolidate their placings as they freewheel down. So just to remind you that Arietta is the leader of the Tour de France on the road at the moment. He's gone over the summit of the Col de Galibier by a minute and 40 seconds over Richard Baron, Laurent Dufault, Lance Armstrong right there in that chase group and all of his main contenders around him except uh, Christophe Moreau who is behind by a minute or so and Abraham Olano is even further back. Welcome back to Tour Plus on Channel 4. Now, over the last few years, the Tour de France has got so big with 2,500 journalists following it that you cannot really get close to the race. 
This is the real center of the operations. These two guys are listening to race radio and even the referee's channel and giving us up-to-date information on exactly what's happening out on the course. They punch the information in and we have a computer screen exactly like this in front of our commentary position and that way we know just exactly how the race is unfolding out on the route at any moment during the day. Well, thanks, Paul. And indeed, the information centre working overtime today, I would think, to try and keep up with the action out in the Alps. Um, we're now just exiting here, Briançon, 183 kilometres into the stage. We're looking here now of the main chase group crossing the city, and there's 25 riders in here now chasing a group of nine men up front. Uh, Beltron caught up with the eight leaders, and in fact, in this group, we've got Pavel Tonkov, Christophe Moreau, and Abraham Olano, Paul. Some big names missed out on the slopes of the Col de Galibier there. And a lot of riders putting a lot of effort to try and pull their leaders back into the race as we now approach the penultimate climb of the day, the Col de Mont Genève. But again, it shows that how difficult it is to ride a mountain stage the day after a rest day. And Abraham Alano not comfortable at all. Armstrong in the front group now, which is nine riders, is fairly happy, I would think, with the composition of this group. There are three riders from Bonesto, two from Kelme, and two from Polti. But in that chasing group behind, which is now 25 riders, he's got his two teammates, Kevin Livingston and Tyler Hamilton. Well, 54 seconds is coming in now, so that group of 25 men are pulling back these leaders, and they could neutralize the day of racing. We're in a Pulte sandwich at the moment. We've got Ivan Gotti on the front and Richard Varenk at the back. And Varenk, remember, rides now for an Italian team. He's shaken hands with the organizer of the Tour de France, but I don't think we can call them friends just yet. And he'll be out to win the stage today in Italy for his sponsors. Ivan Gotti is the other rider at the other end of the bunch here. Now, I hope the, uh, everybody who are members of the Northgate and Middle School in Crawley are paying attention to the route today because I understand on a, each day you're following the Tour de France and tracing the route, so I hope you're enjoying the coverage. Greg sitting at the back of this leading group of, nine, of eight riders now, and obviously now the, the table, table's turned in that team because Gotti has become the team worker for Virenk. This is Paolo Lamfranchi on the front for Team Mappé. He himself moving forward for Pavel Tonkov, trying to put a lot of pressure on the front, helping out the Onse riders, because obviously Tonkov and Olano want to try and catch Armstrong before they get to the foot of the last climb of the day, the Col de Sestriere. Kelme coming to the front now. This rider is Contreras, sitting on the front, setting the pace, thinking only about his teammate. It's amazing the way domestiques ride when they come to this part of a course when they know that all they can do is just do a lot of work for their team leaders they get themselves into a mindset where they don't think about anything else just setting a very sensible pace trying to make sure that they put the other riders in the group into difficulty Armstrong again responding very comfortably to that attack another acceleration this time coming once more from Ivan Gotti Gotti is in great shape in this Tour de France it's a pity he lost so much time in the opening flat stages he still could have found himself being a serious contender for a high overall placing well they're now saying it's gone inside the minute again to 58 seconds back to the chasers by the way we lost the lead out man today for Mario Cipollini will probably lose big Mario tonight if he gets to the finishing line uh, but Gian Matteo Fagnini climbed off uh, today uh, fairly early on before he got to the Col de uh, Galibier and the Col de Telegraph Anyway, these are the men that they go under the 25 kilometers to go banner now. Still together, I think they've got the measure of one another now, Paul, and that they'll stay together to the finish unless somebody nips away for the win. They have to keep the pressure on at the front, though. They have to keep sending the, the team workers to the front of this group to keep the pace high, because otherwise the group behind of Abraham Alano and Pavel Tonkov will close in. And that's what these climbers want to do today. They want to try and distance themselves ahead of riders like Tonkov and Alana before we go to the next time trials because that is the only way that men like Escartin and Alex Zuller can climb their way up the overall rankings. Well, Beltran is now setting the pace here. A climber who was a young man developing alongside Miguel Indurain when he was winning the Tours de France. And now he's coming into his own as a good climber. He sits on the front. His team captain Zuller here joined the Bonesto team this year after leaving Fen 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 uh, Festina last year after the scandal. Varenk also left the Festina team, riding now in the colours of uh, Polti from Italy, the only team indeed who would employ him after the business of last year. And at one stage, Varenk had announced his retirement from the sport, and he was brought back out because of uh, the Polti team. 
This is the chasing group now of Abraham Alana. They're in third position, wearing number 51. Lying third in the overall rankings at the start of the stage this morning, but to today really trying to save himself and keep himself high in the overall rankings. Right on his wheel was Kevin Livingston there. Livingston just happy to let the other teams do the work. He's trying to save as much energy as possible because if this group does catch the Lance Armstrong group, he knows he will then have to share, change roles with the Onsay riders and he will then be the one setting the pace at the front. That's Serrano is doing the work at the moment. Marcos Serrano for Onsay. They've been at the front of the race really since it began this year and we thought it was because they were keeping their man Alano in touch uh, because he was going to come good in the time trial and good in the mountains. Well, as you know, he would get, for the first time in his professional career, he was caught in the time trial. Lance Armstrong went by him. He also fell off in it. So he didn't have a taller happy time trial, though he did finish up with a high finish. And now in the mountains, he's having to fight back rather than dictate the pace. And I think this is all going to work on him uh, morally and mentally more than uh, anything else, Paul, because he's, he's just not leading the race and he's taking all the knocks really been knocked several times it's going to be interesting to see how Lance Armstrong handles the mountains over the next few days because Lance Armstrong is not the same bike rider that he was three or four years ago in fact he's coming into the mountains carrying 20 pounds less weight and that's going to be a serious advantage but the important thing is that for Lance Armstrong is he's never had to ride these mountains as a serious contender for the overall rankings he's ridden them in the Gruppetto on several occasions he's ridden the mountains when it's got too hard he sat up and survived to the finish but now to win the Tour de France he has to ride in the front groups like this all of the time and it'll be interesting to see if he can over the next few days stay consistent in the big alpine passes and there's Escartine going through this is Beltran and just coming on to the back I think we've got Contreras up there now but it shouldn't be it should be um it is Contreras, yes, he's in the back, 113, tagged on. There are just two Kelme riders in this group. Contreras is the man sitting in the, the green and white jersey at the back there. He, in fact, replaced his teammate Castel Blanco. There were three riders from Kelme in this group originally, but in fact, Castel Blanco was left behind. Moving up into second place, the green and white there is the leader of the Kelme squad. That is Fernando Escartin. Up into third, Ivan Gotti. Armstrong always riding halfway down the line so he can keep an eye on the guys in front of him and if there is going to be an attack from behind he'll be able to respond to it respond to it very easily well, climbing up to the Italian borders now we're not too far away and still a fine piece of pacing being done by Manuel Beltran here and sitting on his back wheel Escartine not willing to work with him just at the moment and Ivan Gotti also looking very uh, happy and content a few riders down Armstrong, though, we've never seen him look as though he's in any form of difficulty at all at the moment. So I think uh, things, uh, by the time he gets to the finish, he's going to report a day that has gone very, very well indeed for him. The group behind still not closing in on the Lance Armstrong group with the yellow jersey. In fact, it's gone out to one minute, ten seconds. There in third position there, you can see Abraham Alano. Second position, in fact, for Alano now losing, using the last of his teammates. The man there wearing number 59, in fact, is Marco Serrano. A few moments ago, he had a lot of teammates surrounding him. David Echabria was there, as was Andrea Perron, but they have now dropped off the back of this group. All of this group now suffering to try and stay and support the pace being set by the Onse squad, who are trying to pull their man, Abraham Alano, back into the Tour de France. The ex-World Road Race champion, the current World Time Trial champion, Abraham Alano. Obviously having uh, the first day after the rest day in the Tour de France, not a good one for him in the Alps. It can all change tomorrow when he's loosened off with a little bit of luck as uh, he continues to ride here along. Just uh, nice to see on his back wheel, uh, though, Kevin Livingstone, which did, he did such a wonderful job for Lance on the climb of the Galibier. He's only fallen back into the chase group. And I thought at one moment this group was going to catch up with the Armstrong group. I'm not too sure now, Paul, they're going to get on terms. They were flying along the valley down yeah, through the roads towards Briançon. But then as they started to climb again, let's not forget these guys here are the strongest climbers of the day so far. These are the men who went clear over the Col de la Galibier. And as soon as the road started to tilt upwards, that's when the, the group started not to, to eat into the advantage that they had. Well, I'm doing absolutely magnificent here. And he just keeps his eyes down there. He dare look ahead because he'll only see the road rear up in front of him again. But this is a fine piece of pacemaking, and it's all being done for Alex Zula. 
who continues his ascent up the overall classification tonight now riding in a very select group of climbers starting the day seven minutes eight seconds behind armstrong chances are he'll still be seven minutes eight seconds behind tonight but there won't be so many in between him and armstrong he certainly he's cleared up the the look of the overall standings by the end of this evening the gap now going back to the abraham alano group is stretched out even more to one minute and 12 seconds and that is all because of the tactics of the Tel the kelme team and the Bonesio team they're in the group here with the leader of the Tour de France, the yellow jersey, Lance Armstrong, and they haven't shirked any of the work or the pacemaking at the front because today they have their own plan. They have their job that they need to do, and that is to move their men, Escartine and Alex Zuller there in the white jersey, higher up the overall rankings. Well, they can move whoever they like up for, but this is a brilliant day for Lance Armstrong, the man who feared too many fears most at the moment, Muro Alano. We don't really include Stuart O'Grady. He wasn't expected to be up here in the climbs. But they are being left by another minute and a half by the line today. He's going to be the leader of the tour by nearly four minutes tonight. He certainly will, but the man that he said he was very worried about is in this group, and that's Fernando Escartín. Armstrong really rates the Spanish climber, and he knows that he's not really able to respond to the accelerations that Escartín can put in on the slopes of these big climbs. That's why on the Col de la Guilevier, he did not respond to that attack. He used his teammate Kevin Livingstone to slowly pull himself back into the action. Well, Escartin's best finish in the Tour de France was fifth in 97. He might have better that last year. He was fourth in the race when the, all the Spanish riders uh, pulled out of the Tour during those drug scandals and police raids. And so he never, we never got a chance to see exactly where he would have finished. He's come back with very good form. He's had this fright of an injured knee, which has been treated daily, which he knocked on his handlebars very early on. But it does seem as though he's had a good day today, and it must be OK. Armstrong now setting the pace at the front of this group. The teammates of Fernando Escartín and Alex Zula starting to weaken. The gap down to Abraham Alano still stretching out one minute and 20 seconds. And now it's Virenk's turn to come to the front in the red and white jersey of the Polti squad with one kilometre left to go to the summit of this climb here of Mont Genevre. Well, Jose Arrieta has won the last two big mountain climbs today. He's no longer with this group now. He was dropped by it as the climb started of the Col de Mont Genevre. A 10-kilometer climb taking them to the uh, borders with Italy and then the last uh, 20 kilometers of the day inside Italy and we climb to the top of Sestria. Two of the last three riders to win a Sestria have gone on to win the Tour de France. Now, if Lance Armstrong wins today, I wonder. Lance Armstrong looking across to his team manager there, jo Johan Brunil, just coming alongside as he was at the back of the group there to have a quick word. For Brunil, it will be a chance to look into Armstrong's eyes and have a quick look and see what the muscles look like and see whether or not he's suffering. Brunil, let's not forget, only, only retired from the sport at the end of last year, and he will know Lance Armstrong very well. And the Kelme team have had a great day of racing today. They've had men uh, hurting everybody else all day long. They've still got two left behind here. This is Carlos Contreras, the Colombian rider on the Spanish squad. Uh, two Colombians on the team riding this race, the rest of them all Spanish. They can all climb hills better than anybody we could name, except this little group here around him, perhaps. And uh, Escartín is the Spanish captain, he's right in there now. And we're heading up, uh, the hills in the distance are in Italy, as we head up towards the top of the Mont Genevre. Last uh, road in France for today. A very close, compact group, and once we get to the slopes there of the climb up to Sestriere, then the big attacks will come. And that's when the, the workers of this group, the rider from Bonesto sitting at the back, Beltran, and the rider on the front, Contreras, will be put into difficulty because their team leaders will then start to launch the attacks. And Virenk, I have to say, is looking very comfortable. He's had a lot of work done at the front of this group by his teammate Ivan Gotti, who's just to the right-hand side in the, the red and yellow jersey of Polti there. Virenk will be looking to attack as soon as that climb goes up towards the summit of uh, Sestriere. I wouldn't like to pick a winner right now from this little group. If you look at all their faces, they all look pretty cool and as though they're handling the race very well. They've gone through that bad patch when they were trying to force the gap and now they've all recognised the strengths of each one of the breakaway. Dufault, I think the big danger in that white Seiko jersey in the centre of our picture at the moment, he's the sort of man who looked for the win today. Veron, who's on the left of our picture, was briefly there, number 69. He also would desperately love to win a stage of the Tour de France today. And the yellow jersey of Armstrong, more interested in thinking long term here if anybody sprints away for the win he may not worry about that the fact is he's not going to concede any time and over his immediate rivals he's gaining time today 
the important thing for Armstrong is putting time between himself and Abraham Alano and Pavel Tonkov. He already has a seven-minute advantage over the other riders in this group here in the shape of Escartin and Alex Zuller. The, the most dangerous man to him, though, is Laurent Dufault. Because Dufault was only seventh overall this morning, just four minutes, 19 behind. And as we approach the line, <laughs> the acceleration obviously coming from Richard Birenc, a four-time winner of the King of the Mountains at the Tour de France. Well, Birenc is waiting, waiting, waiting before he goes. Armstrong isn't going to challenge him at all. So it's Birenc, Armstrong, Dufault, the order over the top of Mont Ginevra. Virenk very nervous, he's going to be more nervous over the next few days because he feel that he will be able to pull the King of the Mountains jersey onto his shoulders again. For the moment, it's still on the shoulders of Mariano Piccoli, but only by a few points. And what's going to be very important is the position of these riders at the end of today's stage because Piccoli may well ride towards the Alpe d'Huez as the King of the Mountains tomorrow, but it might be his last day. Welcome back. Now, we haven't seen Mario Cipollini today, which is no surprise on a mountain stage, but it's not because he's gone home, which, if you'll remember, was originally the plan after the time trial in Metz. Apparently, though, Mario decided what with his historic four consecutive stage wins and all, he was obliged to ride the Tour's one Italian stage, Per La Gente, for the people. And just so that La Gente would recognise him this morning, he turned up dressed as Julius Caesar, which naturally was not a for Caesar. The excuse, not that he really needed one, was the 2099th anniversary of Caesar's birth. Either that or Chippo just wanted to force the tour organisers to fine him for a breach of the clothing regulations like they do every year. While well, the organisers obliged and slapped him with a penalty of 6,000 Swiss francs, which was about 3,000 pounds sterling. And lighter in the pocket, but apparently weighed down by history, Chippo set off and has been languishing at the back of the field all day. And for those of you sitting at home thinking things couldn't get much more ludicrous on the equipment front this side of a pair of Gucci cycling shoes, let me present to you, if I can get one out of the bag, the Gucci cycling shoe. £175 at all Bond Street's finest cycling establishments, and I dare you to wear a pair on your next Sunday morning club ride. Thanks, Gary. It's a pity those shoes are one size too big for you. Now, back to the race, and we're now just beginning the climb here which is the climb to the finishing line at Sestria, the climb of Mont Ginevra kept the same group of riders together. There has been a massive regrouping behind of uh, 25 riders coming together, but try as they might, they have not been able to get closer than one minute to this breakaway. And that group contains Christoph Moreau, Pavel Tonkov and Abraham Alano. And just a few moments ago, Paul, Tonkov has crashed along with Kevin Livingstone on the descent. But now we're on the climb, and it looks as though Gotti, who's taken some chances coming down in the rain, has been joined here by Escartin a few seconds in front. Escartin also took a lot of risks to, in fact, match Gotti on the descent there because the descent was very slippy coming through the town at the bottom here of the, the climb towards Sestriere, and they've opened up a gap which now has gone ex in excess of 10 seconds. Lance Armstrong is in, in the second group. Now, he will be watching the progress of Escartin very carefully, and one man who will be biting his bottom lip, waiting for the, the possibility of attack, will be Richard Bireng, because he was looking the most comfortable here, and he'll be a bit surprised that this group allowed his teammate, Ivan Gotti, to ride off the front quite so easily. Now, back to the chase group here. Now, let's see if we can... Uh, in fact, two riders going clear, but that was Alana going away clear. But uh, Well, he's, he's obviously got to make some out. Van der Vauer is the other rider with him. But uh, further back, I'm just wondering if Livingstone and Tonkov have rejoined the group. Well, Kevin Livingstone involved in that la unfortunate accident on the descent there. It was very slippy. A lot of riders in that group behind taking lists. Well, there's an attack there by Armstrong. Well, the yellow jersey has obviously had a great day in his first day in the Alps here. Look at the acceleration of this as he chases down those motorbikes. Five and a half hours he's been pedaling today, marking everything, never looking distressed. And now he's going to try and tear this race apart. Armstrong is riding in the same mode that we used to see from men like Injure and Eddie Merckx. That was an unbelievable attack. He took a lot of risk to go up through the inside there. There was hardly any room at all. Now Alex Zuller has to respond. He realizes this is a good attack by Armstrong. He wants to try and get up to the wheel of the American. He wants to get up there because Armstrong really picked it up rapidly. And you can see how quickly Richard Virenk went out of the back. Well, this can only tell us that, that uh, Lance Armstrong is feeling absolutely superb. I was talking to a journalist only yesterday who said Armstrong is not the type of rider to follow and wait. He is too impetuous, and he's, that point is being proved now. 
he's a tough rider he's just like a boxer when you listen to him talking about the Tour de France he says nobody's gonna drop me in the mountains I'm gonna fight all the way and he will fight all the way because that's his mentality he likes to put on a show and that's what he's doing today he realizes how important the climb is to Sestriere it is an epic climb it is a climb that has gone down in very many legendary stories and he's gone across that gap in an unbelievable distance well, I reckon he's about eight kilometers from the finish of the stage today, and the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France has just done what all classic great winners of this race has done in the past. Prove you are the best by going up and joining the leaders and making it look easy. I'm sorry the pictures are breaking up, but again, the bad weather is starting to move in here. Straight up to the wheel of Escartine, onto the wheel of Gotti. Now he's showing these two riders, OK, I'm back. That was a nice try, but I've got the, I've got the measure of you. There's no way you're going to ride away from me on this mountain. And a little look across there by Escartine. He couldn't oh. believe it was the yellow jersey of Armstrong riding up to his back wheel. Paul. But, <laughs> Sorry, Paul, but that's going to be a real blow to these two. An unbelievable blow. Gotti thought he was going to ride away to a great victory in Italy. Escartine now panicking a bit, looking over his shoulder. He wants to know what the position is out on the road of Alex Zuller. Armstrong not worried. He said, come on, right, I'm going to pick up the pace once again. I've got Zuller in difficulty. Richard Virenk is a long way behind. And even further down the main road is Abraham Alano. Alex Zuller, the Swiss rider, who is really looking now to try and pull himself back up to Armstrong, but he's having a hard time. He's been forced now to do something I don't think he was prepared to do today, and that was going out on his own and use a bit more strength because he's going to have to try and get back up to these three now. Escartine must be absolutely stunned by this. We talk of Escartine as a climber. We talk of Armstrong as a strong man. And Armstrong is ripping the legs off this climber right now. Well, I was talking with Armstrong a couple of days ago about his performance in the time trial. He said to me, well, if you think that's good, wait till you see me in the mountains. My advisors have told me I'm going to be better in the mountains than I am in the time trial. And let's not forget, Phil, he's carrying almost 20 pounds lighter up these mountains than he was three or four years ago. And he's got the strength that he had before. The arrival of Alex Zuller is imminent now. It's been a big effort from Zuller, this, the Swiss rider coming across. And, you know, I'm just wondering if Armstrong is going to let him on or jump away from those two again. He's not too worried. Don't forget, Alex Zuller is over seven minutes behind in the overall ranking. Armstrong is so comfortable, he jumped across that gap. That gap was up to 30 seconds, and he ripped across it in less than one kilometer. Another acceleration now coming from Ivan Gotti. Immediately, Armstrong has re reacted to that. But what it's done is, in fact, it's put Alex Zuller into a bit more difficulty. But Zuller riding sensibly. He's pulling himself up to the leading group of three. So the group of six is down to a group of four now, and gone is uh, Contreras, and surprisingly, Richard Veronk has gone as well. These four riders now climbing their way to the summit in Italy. In Sestria, the only time we come into Italy this year, one Italian would dearly love to win here, and that's the winner of the Tour of Italy this year, Ivan Gotti. And I believe he thought he had it when he went clear with Escartine, but he, he had a double take when he saw the yellow jersey come up behind. They didn't expect Armstrong to react like that. They would have expected an attack to come from behind from somebody like Alex Zuller. But the way Armstrong came across, it was so easy. It was impressive. He really just danced on those pedals and ripped himself across a 30-second deficit straight to the front. And now he's decided, I'm the yellow jersey. There's no team legs left. I'm going to control this race and dictate the pace that I want. What a wonderful picture there of the yellow jersey of the Tour de France proving to this point in this race he really is the best rider in it. Johan, Johan Bernil yes. coming up alongside. He obviously wants Armstrong to cool it off a little bit. Armstrong is flying up this climb here. Complete concentration. This is the face that he had just a few days in the time trial. And that is the team manager's car going alongside him there. And it would be interesting to know exactly what Johan Bernil is going to say to him at this moment. Well, he must be concerned. He's probably saying, Lance, you don't need to do this. Just keep it cool. You're winning the Tour de France. But Lance, uh, Lance just wants to win the Tour de France like the all-time greats who ever won this big event because he's really hurting these three riders now. Otherwise, there wouldn't be that gap between the wheel of Escartine and Lance Armstrong. Armstrong is setting a pace there, which is so difficult for these other guys to follow. Let's not forget the man in second place has cracked Escartine. Fernando Escartine, the climber, is being ridden off the back wheel of Lance Armstrong, and they cannot respond to this pressure. Zulov isn't ready. He's just come here. He hasn't recovered from the chase, and I don't think Gotti's got it left. The gap is there. Armstrong knows he's got the gap now. As soon as he looked back under his shoulder there, he it's saw, and he's accelerated. He's out of the saddle, sprinting up this climb now. He's trying to really put a real clenched fist onto the Tour de France today, and he's 
flying up this mountain. A physical and mental delivery here by Lance Armstrong to all of his rivals in the Tour de France. He is just going faster and faster and faster, and he is going to win this stage, and he is going to go minutes ahead of the field because of it too. Psychologically, this will be a major blow to men like Fernando Escartin. Fernando Escartin went out very early on the Col de la Galibier because they knew they needed to get big time on Lance Armstrong. He put in a lot of effort to try and put Armstrong into difficulty, and Armstrong used his teammates sensibly. He waited for Tyler Hamilton to fade away, and then he was left with just Kevin Livingston. Livingston rode sensibly over the top of the Col de la Galibier and then went into difficulty. Armstrong then left on his own, but again, he's managed to tactically turn the race to his advantage. Richard Virenk further down the road now currently in fourth position on the road fifth position on the road is one minute and 20 seconds behind Armstrong this has to be the greatest comeback in any sport at all the fact that Armstrong managed to conquer cancer was unbelievable but the fact that he's riding like this in the Tour de France is also impressive Alex Zola now has gone clear a lone pursuit for him behind Armstrong he's dropped Escartine and Gotti but this is a man just trying to survive trying to limit his losses this man has managed to come back from the face of death and now he's riding at the front of the Tour de France like a Trojan. He's inside, two kilometers from the finish. Uh, less than one and a quarter miles to go for him now. And with every re pedal rev, he is taking time out of every man. Tomorrow is a vicious day, harder than today to Altuez. Lance Armstrong is though, he's gaining his time now. I don't know what he'll do tomorrow now because we can't say he'll sit by and watch. Not the way he's riding this race. Two kilometers to go now for Alex Zula, the man who's tried to show some resistance. Remember, Alex had to join the break before he could go in the chase of Armstrong. If people thought Ar Lance Armstrong was going to crack in the mountains, it really is an impressionable for performance of his today. Alex Zula is closing in slowly on Armstrong. Armstrong, I think, now starting to ride within himself, making sure that he can survive up to the finish line. He doesn't want to hurt himself too much because he knows there's a big mountain stage tomorrow, and I'm sure that's what Johan Brunil told him. Do enough to win the stage, but don't hurt yourself too much. The Tour de France is still two weeks to go. Well, it's wise advice, of course. Here's the... The Italian crowd here now cheering on Lance Armstrong. They've seen him coming up on a big screen up here. Armstrong racing up. Zula is closing in. 22 seconds is the time gap, but I don't think you'll see Lance till he's got his coat on. One kilometre to go to the finish now for Lance Armstrong. It's going to be a veritable sprint up the hill for this man in yellow because he is being pulled to that finishing line. A total man possessed. He wanted that yellow jersey back, and now he's doing it absolute justice. He is the best man on the day, the first day in the Alps. And once again, it may well be that injury has, in fact, had a big part to play on Lance Armstrong season so far he was robbed of the chance of going to ride Liège Baston Liège because of a crash in the Tour of Valencia he came back and prepared himself specifically just for one World Cup race that was the Amstel goal race he was beaten in a photo finish by Michael Bogart and then I think Johan Brunil said get it in your mind you can do a great ride at the Tour de France and having Johan Brunil alongside him is a very important factor because Brunil himself is a man who's ridden for the overall rankings at the Tour de France and that's going to be a big asset for Lance over the next few days in and out of the saddle now as he rides up to the top of Sestriere. He'll be up amongst the chalets very soon. They've moved the finish slightly. It's a little bit further on this time around than it was when Bjorn Arise won in 96. But it doesn't matter now because he's got about half a kilometre to go towards the end. And he's over the top of the climb. Well, one kilometre precisely as we see the kite just ahead of him. There's the red kite indicating just 1,000 metres to go to the finish line. He will be getting maximum points in the King of the Mountains, but he doesn't care about that today. All he's caring about is getting as much time advantage over everybody in the race as possible, and also throwing down a psychological blow to the big climbers of the Tour de France who thought over the next couple of days they would put him into difficulty. He's turned the tables, and in fact, that's what he's done. He's damaged the climbers in their own terrain. Lance Armstrong hasn't eased off these pedals at all. He has kept his rhythm going. And um, we're sure the superlatives now to continue just to say how wonderful this performance is from Lance Armstrong. He's been absolutely superb. 173 riders left the Grand Bourne on today. Destination, the Col de Telegraph, the Col de Glibier, and Mont Genève, and finally Sestrier. And now there is only one who's going to get to the line ahead of everybody else. He's American, his name is Lance Armstrong, and it's a long time since we've seen a performance like this.
this is a performance of great champions he rode sensibly with his team he never panicked and when he saw he could put the hammer down he took the opportunity he never thought about the couple of days that he's got to come the couple of days when he will have to climb up to the Alpe d'Huez and defend his yellow jersey he just thought about putting the hammer down hard and getting as much time advantage over everybody else and there is an American flag to wave him home and the rain starts again as Lance Armstrong conquers Sestria. Now he heads up towards the line. He's just a shade under six hours in the saddle today. So he didn't suffer from the rest day, did he? As Armstrong now has torn his rivals apart here in the Tour de France. They will have to go home tonight and rethink their tactics tomorrow in the Alps because if this man comes out like this tomorrow, the Tour de France really will be over. He's left nothing to the imagination. Well, this will take him back to his victories at Beach Mountain, but we're an awful lot higher than Beach Mountain in the Tour du Pont here. 400 meters to go for Armstrong, and never once has his face changed, never once has his pedaling revs changed either. He's been absolutely controlled all the way to the line. He looks over his shoulder to make sure nobody is coming, zips up the Maillot Jean. He's done that proud today and I think he's getting ready for a two-arm salute. You don't get that privilege in a time trial. You ride fast and you win. He's done that twice in this Tour de France. Now he has ridden fast and dropped his rivals. Mano, oh, Mano. So now he is going to cross the line, I think. This will be some victory salute. It'll be a while before we know if it is as the winner of the Tour de France, but there are a few people in this race now will doubt that. Lance Armstrong comes across the line. Winner today of the mountain stage of the Tour de France. And the man who has tried to limit the escape of Armstrong coming up to the line now, the seconds are counting. In fact, it looked as though Zilla was closing in. There's the clock for you all to see. He'll be just on 30 seconds, though, down on Lance Armstrong. But even so, he has made a second place on the line. 31 seconds it will probably be rounded up to. And the arrival of the men he just left exploded on the mountains. Fernando Escartin leading over Ivan Gotti. These two thought they had the race sewn up seven kilometers from the summit. They're now racing for third and fourth place. And I wonder if Gotti will try and jump around Escartin. I would think so because he's Italian, but you never know. But look at the time gaps on the right hand side of the screen here. In fact, I don't think uh, there's anything left in Gotti now as Escartin comes up to the line and he will take the third place finish but the gaps are what's important in a race on time and these are big one minute 25 seconds and Richard Varong who looked very sharp when he was sprinting out the points on the high mountains hit the wall about 10 kilometers ago and he's now in all sorts of trouble he's being pipped on the line here by Beltran I think it is who's just come from absolutely nowhere and found himself a pair of fresh legs and in fact, uh, heading up to the line, the Bernesto rider is uh, Beltran, Manuel Breltran. So he's found his second win as he comes up for fifth place on the stage. The Ronk will get sixth. And uh, then the man behind, Conter Contreras, will take seventh place. And the gaps continue to grow. So as the riders continue to finish and the gaps continue to grow, let's go to Paul Sherwin now. He's with Lance. A lot of people expected the climbs to go out for you today. You actually turned the tables around and gave them a big slap in the face. Well, I wanted, but uh, I wanted to answer some questions about that because there was a lot of people that uh, that, that figured my climbing was suspect, and and uh, you I think, that today. no, I mean, I I, I gave a response, but uh, I wasn't trying to to uh, to shove it in anybody's face. I just wanted to. I felt good. I saw an opportunity, so Dufault was dropped. Dufault was my main concern, and when he was dropped, then I went. And boy, did he go. Let's have a look at the stage result then. Armstrong winning by 31 seconds over Alex Zula. One minute 26 over Fernando Escartin, the same time given to, to Ivan Gotti. But of the others, well, Alano finished here with the Belgian Van der Vauer and has lost over three minutes. And Laurent Dufault, well, he must have really hit the wall because he lost even more. And Pavel Tonkov, who slipped on the descent coming into Italy, he lost over five minutes. Chris Borman arrived amid a torrential cloudburst. He lost more than 40 minutes. Lance Armstrong on the podium for the third time in this Tour de France. He is really ripping the race apart. Let's now have a look at the overall situation here. Armstrong leading Abraham Olano by six minutes and three seconds. Christophe Moreau, they swap places, these two is third, 7.44 back. Alex Zuller continues to ascend the classification. He is now up to fourth, but look at that, seven minutes, 47 seconds behind. 
Well, ninth in the race now is Richard Berenk, and tonight he returns to the podium to pull on the polka dot jersey as leader of the King of the Mountains, a title he's won already four times. And there's a new leader in the green jersey as well. Stuart O'Grady of Australia pulls on the green jersey for the first time. Jan Kersipu dropped on the call to Telegraph today, gave up. The Alps showed their worst face to the Tour de France yesterday, torrential rain turning the roads into a skid pan. It forced out the stars of the opening week. Gone now, Jan Kersipu, who led for six days. Gone too, Mario Cipollini, who won four stages. Down, but certainly not out, Pavel Tonkov. But there was a lone star, his name Lance Armstrong. The Texan triumphed at Sestrier in solitary splendor. He waited until the finish was almost in sight and then destroyed his final few rivals on this opening day in the Alps. He leads by a long way overall, but has not lost his respect for the Tour de France. Yeah, but I still think that the that, that I can have another, I mean, if I have a bad day, it's, it, it's, it's all over. But right now, it's the others who probably think it's all over. Armstrong leads Abraham Olano by six minutes and three seconds, and Christophe Moreau by seven minutes 44. Alex Zuller has ascended now to fourth place. Of the others, Richard Berenk has climbed up to ninth and leads in the King of the Mountains competition. Stuart O'Grady has gone down to 77th, but he leads in the green jersey competition. Chris Borman is 144th. So, hello and welcome to Alpe d'Huez. Well, it's Bastille Day here in France, the second day for the riders in the high mountains of the Alps. Lance Armstrong has won the first mountain stage. Can he take the second? You know everybody wants to win the climb of Alpe d'Huez. Is there anybody in this race who can beat him? Gary Imlac was on the Alp this morning, canvassing opinion. Well, Alpe d'Huez, as you know, is one big canvas of opinion. And if our sampling of unofficial road signs on the way up is anything to go by, it's going to be a landslide win for Richard Virenc. Richard de Bez. Allez, Richard! Virenc. J'espère Virenc. <laughs> Michael Bogle. Rolling at Armstrong. McGrady. Yeah. <laughs> Virenc, potato. <laughs> Virenc. Interestingly enough, the tour's most famous mountain finish has only ever seen one French victor, Bernaino, back in 1986. And Bastille Day would seem to be the perfect stage to make it number two. However, given their relationship with the leading domestic candidate, I suspect the race organisers would be happy to see the Baron run continue. Well, we'll be seeing the crowds on Alpe d'Huez a little later on. Right now, though, the riders are on the lower slopes of the Col de Montseny, and that will take them up to the 67-kilometre point. And as you can see, they're all together, and that's the way it's been ever since the rollout this morning. One rider not with them at the start line, so we're only da uh, down to 166 now. Zbigniew Spruk, who crashed yesterday, uh, hasn't started this morning. And in fact, uh, 51 riders uh, were visited by the UCI medical inspectors at the hotel before the start and were obliged to give compulsory blood tests. But they're all... The hematocrit level is all less than 50% and they've all been allowed to start. So that's good news, Paul. Excellent news, but it's a very difficult day's racing for the riders. It starts off overcast. There will be some sunny spells. There is expected to be fog over the summits of the mont and the Col de la Croix de Fer, and there will be very strong winds at those summit, summits as well, up to 25 kilometers an hour. Again, a big variation in temperature for the riders today. 25 degrees Celsius in the valleys, just 10 degrees Celsius over the top of the mont uh, the nice and 14 degrees Celsius at the top of the Alpe d'Huez. And we're watching the riders in glorious sunny weather here as they tackle the first big climb of the day. This is an all-category climb, which means it's among the steepest of the tour. And uh, the riders haven't turned a pedal in anger except for the first sprint of the day at Graver, uh, which came at 37 kilometres. And Eric Zabel's teleconvoy has got themselves into big gears there, led him out perfectly for the sprint. And uh, he stayed ahead of Stuart O'Grady, who got second, and Christophe Capel taking third. 
Uh, so Zabo pulled back a couple of points in that green jersey competition, but O'Grady still keeps the lead for the moment at least. Now, Paul, this is uh, good for Lance Armstrong, this nice gentle start to the day after all of the effort yesterday, I would imagine. Good for a lot of other bike riders in the tour as well because this is a very difficult stage 220 kilometers three big mountain passes to go over and the col de Montsigny is very difficult from this side which is why there's been no major attacks just now because i think a lot of the the teams like uh Calme, like banesto are thinking much further up the road before they try and put their strategies into play and they want to have as many teammates there as possible as we ride into the mountains it would be a good uh, day to feature our rider Today it will be Richard Virenc, four times a winner of the King of the Mountains at the Tour de France. Richard Virenc's 1 meter 78, he weighs 65 kilos, so that's light enough to get himself up with the top climbers in the Tour. He's 29 years of age. He was born, in fact, in Casablanca in Morocco and moved across to the south of France when he was very young. And in fact, he's one of the rare French cyclists to come out of that part of France. He's extremely popular with the public. In fact, he's probably France's most favorite cyclist. And when that uh, doping scandal hit the Tour de France last year, surrounding the Festina squad it really divided the Tour de France supporters into two the pro and against Richard Virenc as a cyclist though he's had some great performances and most of his star most of his star performances have been really at the Tour de France with three stage victories all of them in the mountains Luzard de Den, Courteret and Courcheval but in fact his his dream was to win the Tour de France and he's been very close he's finished second overall and third overall and in fact he wore the yellow jersey back in 1992 Richard Virenc this year won a stage of the Giro d'Italia at again a mountain top finish and he still despite the cloud over over him he still does not admit to having taken drugs and that's why Richard Virenc is still riding in the Tour de France and today riding in the polka dot jersey the jersey that he really feels is his own these are Polti riders now in the red and yellow jerseys of team Polti there in third fourth position now the polka dot jersey right on the wheel of the polka dot jersey in the blue and pink shirt there of the Lamprey squad is the former leader of the King of the Mountains, Mariano Piccoli, and he's still very happy with the tempo. He's obviously not too happy with getting dropped from that leading group of five riders yesterday, but he's certainly in a position now to take on Richard Virenc. He's only a couple of points behind him in the overall standings of the King of the Mountains, and Virenc will be looking for a, a maximum points over the top of this climb. Well, now the Palti boys have been told by Virenc to lift the pace a little bit, and... Uh, Hurt one or two of the riders, so the tempo has been lifted as we start to head up towards the summit of the climb. And uh, we can't see the back of the main field at the moment, but I would think it's be starting to thin out a little bit. Poor old Axel Merckx is now a couple of minutes behind this group, and it doesn't look good at all for him. Axel Merckx really suffering. This is a bad day for Axel. He finished 10th in the Tour de France last year. His dad's come to see him race today. And he knows, he's knowing now what the Tour de France really is all about. The ups and downs of the Tour de France. It is so difficult when you're in the mountains. If you have the slightest problem, you can't even follow the slow pace that's being set at the front of the main field just now. A lot of riders have been throwing out sandbags at the moment because they were very happy to, to have the main field bowling along with that tempo being set to the front very often by many of the sprinters, riders like Robbie McEwen. And now the fact that they're getting closer to the summit, they really will be starting to suffer at the back of this group. But what they'll try and do, in fact, is to keep themselves not too far off when we go over the summit of the climb, and they'll take big risks on the descent to try and get themselves back into the main field. If you go over the top of a climb like this, one or two minutes in arrears, you can very easily build, get back on if you take one or two risks on the descent. Now we are getting a lot closer because the spin starting to warm up and Virenk's mates, in fact, starting to slip back. Yeah, I think we may have uh, missed the one kilometre to go because the start to warm up for the sprint here. Now leading them out is Stefan Gubert on the Palti team and he's leading out for Renk. Konishev has got his back wheel here. Uh, Piccoli has dropped away from it a little bit. Uh, Konishev uh, is a very good sprinter. He was the first Soviet man to ever lead the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France. And of course, he's a Russian these days and he's also the first Soviet rider to ever win a medal at the World Cycling Championship for Professionals. And Konishev showing he's still got a lot of sprinting power in those legs. Varenk is digging in now to try and bring him back, but it looks as though Varenk, uh, because he's not being challenged by Armstrong nor by Piccoli, he will keep the lead in the polka dot jersey competition. Although victory on the line there has gone to Dmitry Konishev, he gets the 40 points, and uh, just behind him comes... Just behind him. Let's have a look again. 40 points then, and 35 for Varenk, uh, so he gets second place. 
And Konishev was 10th overall, but he's now with that 40 point fall. He gets 70 points. He's now up to fourth place in the King of the Mountains. And I bet he didn't expect to be, be the first man up this climb. But the bunch have chosen uh, to make uh, an easy day of it so far. And I don't blame them because the Col de la Croix de Fer is a very, very difficult climb. It's a very narrow climb. And I think Lance Armstrong will pay very close attention to who does the attacking on that climb. Quickly was really blown away then with that acceleration of Richard Berenk's team there. And you can see that sprint over the top really has opened up quite a gap over the main field. But they won't insist at the moment because they know that if they do start to put a bit of pressure onto this little advantage they have at the moment, then Lance Armstrong's team will close down on them very rapidly indeed because they won't let a man like Richard Berenk ride away from the main field on a big mountain stage like this. Well, there's Konishev slipped back into second place now, not uh, pushing home the attack at all. The reason being, it's a long, long way down to the valley floor now and the feeding station for the riders. Because uh, the hill is behind them, it would be sheer folly to launch an attack here and expect to stay away to the finish with something like 160 kilometres still to ride today. See the big long line of the main field. They know that Richard Virenka sometimes does try and take advantage of a little... Uh, breakaway situation like this and they've picked up the pace very rapidly indeed and it's the the blue jerseys on the front of Lance Armstrong's US Postal Service team who have decided we're going to nail this back immediately just to show that we are in control of the main field and we want to try and keep this together until the final climbs. So Mondini setting the pace just now but they're all back together again. Mondini got third place over the climb and now they're all back together again. The capes are going on for the long descent to keep the chill out. And it is pretty chilly up on the top of these coals, by the way. It can be as little as 10 degrees Celsius up there. By the time they get down the bottom, they'll be in the mid to high 20 degrees. So the temperature changes are quite, quite different. And what they're worried about, of course, Paul, is catching a bronchitis. It's so easy to do once you ride uh, into the Tour de France after two weeks. The, the body starts to get weak. You start to get run down. And the, ch the change in temperature between the valleys and the summits of these mountains really is what causes the riders to pick up chills and bronchitis is probably the worst thing you could have when you're riding a stage of the Tour de France because you just cannot breathe and you can't get the energy into the system. So levelling out on the sort of plains high up in the mountains here really because there's no descent at the moment just gently coming away from the surface uh, from the uh, plateau of the top of the Col de Montseny and they'll drop down towards Monday Modain. But look at this, Paul. Somebody decides they want to lie. This is from uh, Modini here, who's trying to liven the pace up and cause a reaction. Now, there's two types of tactic here. We could see some of the riders who have lost big time uh, trying to get a group going in the hope that they will not be chased and get a good lead before they get to the Alps. A lot of the lesser riders who had a hard time in the mountains yesterday would hope on this section of the course, which is probably the easiest section of the course today, they can take advantage of that. But you can see nobody's letting small groups go off the front, and that attack was brought into the fold again very quickly. Welcome back. It's the big mountain stages like today that the certified non-climbers like I used to be really fear because you know you've got a serious chance of going out of the Tour de France. I used to spend a lot of time the night before working out what I thought the average speed was going to be because you only have a certain amount of time to finish after the winner crosses the line. And in those days, even if you'd worked it out, when you crossed the line, you weren't sure if you were still in the bike race. Nowadays, when a rider hits this finish line, he knows that he's still in the Tour de France because once the winner crosses the line, the bottom clock there starts to tick. If it's still going when you arrive, you're in the bike race. If it goes to black, you're out. Well, it'll be a while yet before that clock starts counting out the riders today, but there might well be some, Paul, as we watch them on the lower slopes now of the Col de la Croix de Fer, and we started to get some counter-attacks. Look, like Laurent Debien maybe making a move here. As we look at the rider from Cofidis, we can tell you straight away the two riders broke clear on the descent coming down from the Mont Chenis, and that was Stefan Erlo and Thierry Bourguignon, and they are leading at the moment at the start of the climb of the Col de la Croix de Fer by 11 minutes and 20 seconds, and it looks, in fact, as though Roland Meyer from Cofidis now has tried to go clear. At the talking point, we saw Eddie Mer Axel Merckx rather was dropped while Eddie Merckx's father was in a car. Well, Axel is now abandoned with stomach cramps, and uh, other riders have gone too. Leon Van Bon, who was having a cold spray applied to his right knee, has also stopped. The sprinter, Jan Zorada, and the Pavel Padrinos. So we've lost uh, 
now four members of the Lamprey team. Just goes to show how difficult yesterday's stage was. Once again, US Postal at the front of this main group now doing a lot of work for Lance Armstrong. And the pace that they've set has already shed a lot of riders and put many riders into difficulty at the back. A lot of the sprinters forming at the rear now into what uh, is commonly known as the autobus. And for the moment, the, the last man on the overall standings is in that autobus, and that's Jay Sweet, and he's been joined by the Australian champion, Hank Vogels. You can see the big long line on the front of the peloton there, the blue jerseys. That's the US Postal Service. They're keeping the pace high. They're not worried too much about the two leaders. The two leaders, Stefan Herlo in the white jersey and Thierry Bourguignon in the white and yellow red jersey. That's the big Matt Aubervilliers team. He's a teammate of uh, Jay Sweet. He's more than 18 minutes behind in the overall standings. That group, uh, Paul, is getting quite big back there because, in fact, the uh, US Postal have lost one of the workers in... Uh, Derame, he's gone off the back. Stuart O'Grady is there. Pickley, uh, surprisingly, has now been dropped as well and is back in that group. Uh, it's swelling quite to be quite a large group. Richard Bereng had a puncture. He's rejoined the main field. And it looks as though Meyer here is pushing on to try and reach those two leaders first. Another rider leaping out of the main field as well. There, caught a glimpse of an Onse rider. So again, Onse trying to turn the tables and tactically put Lance Armstrong into difficulty. They may well be that Abraham Alano has recovered from that day yesterday. He certainly didn't ride well on the first day in the mountains here at the Tour de France. But even after that, he still has kept his high place overall. Second at the moment, six minutes, six minutes and three seconds behind Lance Armstrong in the standings. Well, a chance to look at the early slopes here. This is a long climb here, almost 30 kilometers. A very steep climb, a much harder climb than the Mont Chenis we saw earlier. And they're not going to come rushing out of the pack, I don't think. Even at the speed they are climbing now, there's some 30 riders being dropped by the main peloton, including, rather surprisingly, Savaldelli has gone off the back as well, and Jackie Durand. Uh, they've also lost contact now. Roland Meyer, the rider from Cofidis, who's leapt out of the front of the main group here. In fact, finished seventh overall in the Tour de France last year in an all-conquering Cofidis performance because they had third overall Bobby Julik, fourth overall, in fact, Christophe Rinero. And this man we're looking at now finished in seventh place. But it's been really difficult for Cofidis to actually show this year in the Tour de France and very much a weakened team after the, the tendonitis that has hit last year's King of the Mountains winner, Christophe Rinero and that crash a few days ago of Bobby Julik in the time trial. Yes, and Julik, by the way, uh, he's confirmed now as having cracked two ribs and a, a small fracture of his elbow as well, but they think he'll be cycling again within two weeks, and that will be pretty good news for Bobby. This is Armand Mayer, and he's got himself 14 seconds now over the field and looks to be climbing very smoothly on the early slopes of the Col de la Croix de Fer. And once over the top of this, uh, then it's down and around to the Alp and up the climb of Alp Durez. Meyer, Roland Meyer, said Armanelli, Roland Meyer, the Cofidis rider, he is 50th overall and 32 minutes behind Lance Armstrong at the moment. Back up to the two leaders, Stefan Erlo a couple of days ago, remember he was in that long breakaway when he had a lead of seven minutes. At that time he was a challenger in the tour overall. He sat up and he waited for the main field and left, uh, let Thierry Gouvenu, uh, I think it was, uh, carry on there, there by himself. 